Good evening in here in Europe and uh, good afternoon now in Brazil. This is the last uh, session, the sixth session, the, sang, the, the last session uh, of this uh, uh, Fortaleza's Australian Spring School, in which you have been touching several, several, uh, uh, um, several subjects with many professionals. The second one is also intended to, to just uh, make uh, an overview, but a deep overview, in fact, about the blue growth. And we have three different professionals that work on very, very, very different uh, subjects with uh, different know-how, which they will illustrate about uh, the last, the, the, if you, how can I say, the, the, the edge of the science in some of this uh, blue growth panorama, which is so important nowadays, especially in this, the, in this decade of the oceans. So the first person who I want to introduce you is Professor Alberto Nunes. Alberto Nunes uh, is a full professor of the Labomar in the Federa Universidad Federal do Ceará. And he is specialized in aquaculture, in fact, the specialization of Alberto is uh, most uh, focused on the nutritional facts of aquaculture and especially on shrimp aquaculture. He has been uh, studied and working few many years ago in Newfoundland to start with this uh, with this career. Uh, Newfoundland in the, in the Saint John's University the, in Saint John, sorry, the Memorial University. And then during these years have been developing lots of improvements about the way in which uh, you have to uh, feed the uh, aquaculture ponds and uh, the different organisms, especially, uh, as, I, uh, as I said, uh, shrimp farms. He has been working with private companies of Norway, uh, also of uh, Germany, France, uh, the Netherlands and the United States, a part, of course, of the companies of Brazil. So, uh, welcome, Alberto. Uh, I'd like to, first of all, thanks everybody for this opportunity. Uh, I'm, I'm not speaking to the regular audience that I find in aquaculture meetings. So I'm pretty sure this is going to be very fun. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. Just uh, tell me if my screen is appearing. Okay. Perfect. Okay, can you yes. see my screen? Yes, yes. All right, excellent. Perfect. Okay, okay go so, on. Uh, thanks very much. For this introduction, as uh, Sergio told, uh, said, I'm a professor at Labomar. I've been working at Labomar for the past 18 years, and my expertise is uh, on um, feeds and feeding of farm-raised uh, marine shrimp and marine fish. We've we've had the opportunity in the past to work with marine fish in the lab, but since it's not widespread in Brazil, it's not a commercial activity in Brazil. The main focus is actually marine shrimp. So today I'm going to speak about the basics uh, on aquaculture um, and how aquaculture is changing the aquatic protein supply from hunting to farming. So uh, I would like to start by saying that much of the fish that we eat today does not come from fisheries anymore. It is actually farmed. When I say much, I mean more than half of the fish eaten by humans today are from aquatic farms. The other important fact to consider is that food fish consumption has significantly increased over the past 60 years in every single part of the world. At a global level, fish consumption in 1961 was recorded at nine kilograms per capita. In 2017, this has more than doubled, reaching an average of 20.3 kilograms per capita. This is equivalent to an annual growth rate of about 3.1% per year. It is much higher than the global human population growth rate, which is about 1.6% per year, and more than the average consumption of any other animal protein source, such as meat, elk, eggs, milk, uh, and these, uh, the, the production of, the consumption of these uh, protein sources is around 
increases at around 2.1 percent per year uh so fish uh consumption has really increased and the only uh meat that uh has a higher uh consumption per year is actually poultry which is increasing at a rate of 4.7 percent so we need to realize that capture fisheries will no longer act as the main supplier of aquatic proteins to human, human consumption. There are several reasons for that, but perhaps the major one is that many fish stocks are simply in a very bad state. They are either fully exploited or overexploited. Uh, so these stocks can no longer support the pressure imposed by industrial fisheries. To give you an idea, a recent paper that came out in Nature just last month uh, from Australia. Altars were from Australia and they have analyzed the catch data of 138 out of 163 fishing countries between 2006 and 2014. They have reported that 91 of all fish and invertebrate caught are on the red list of threatened species. So this is quite relevant. And if we continue to fish the way we're fishing today, some of these stocks will basically disappear as, as we have in many countries. Cod fisheries in Newfoundland in Canada has collapsed. We have examples here in Brazil that of fisheries that have also collapsed. We have lobster fisheries in a very bad status. We know that fisheries involves many jobs and still has a social importance. So governments in many countries continue to provide subsidies to increase fishing capacity. This allows companies to operate at economic loss, but at the same time threatens the decline of fish and invertebrate populations. If we examine the most recent statistics from FAO, fish food consumption in 2018 reached 156.4 million metric tons meaning that that intake increased 122% between 1990 and 2018. Capture fishery landings, on the other hand, only increased 14% within that period, while aquaculture increased at 527%. So aquaculture appears to be the only way to meet the aquatic protein deficit at a large scale. By 2030, predictions indicate that 62% of all fish for human consumption will derive from aquaculture farms. As it is clear in this graph, fishery landings will remain pretty stable over the next decade, while aquaculture production will continue to grow. In 2030, aquaculture output will be near 110 million metric tons, an increase in excess of 32% relative to 2018. The rise in income from developing countries and a greater awareness about the health benefits of fish consumption are the main drivers for the increase in the demand for aquatic proteins. On the other hand, aquaculture production is increasing driven by the technological advances in the areas of nutrition, genetics, disease control, and biosecurity, and also production management. That's what I'm going to talk about now, so you can have an idea how aquaculture shift in the aquatic protein supply. First, the process of farming an aquatic animal or aquatic plant is made step by step, like manufacturing a car. One thing we need to keep in mind is when we stock an animal under confinement, it is important to mimic some of the environmental conditions found in their own natural habitat in terms of salinity, temperature, and other water quality parameters. Here we have the production chain of marine shrimp farming in Brazil. It begins in a hatchery uh, where sexually mature adults of shrimp are stocked in tanks under very strict water quality conditions. Shrimp, these adult shrimp will then mate, they will spawn and fertilized eggs will be released into the water. Then they will be uh, transported to a commercial farm when post larvae reaches about 18 to, to 21 days of age. That's an animal of about two to three milligrams body weight, very small animals. At the farm, when uh, shrimp arrives at the farm, when these post larvae arrive at the farm, 
they can be stocked in earthen pond or four here on the bottom or they can be stocked in what we call nursery tanks these are uh much smaller than earthen ponds they they may have about fifty thousand uh cubic meters to three hundred thousand cubic meters but these are considered small tanks and they will remain in these tanks that we call nursery between five to ten days for acclimation purposes or they can be raised for longer period until they reach between three milligram 300 to about one gram body weight at this point they can be transferred to the earthen ponds and then they will be raised for an additional 60 to 121 days depending on the targeted body weight the market demands if the market wants a larger shrimp it will take longer to reach that size from the farm the uh, harvested shrimp will be immediately transferred to processing plants where they are cleaned classified in regards to their body weight frozen and packed so in less than five months in total we can go from eggs to the finished product ready to be consumed and the process uh, the rearing process is pretty much the same for the other species that we farm. Uh, however, uh, aquaculture is very diversified in regard to the number of farm species. Uh, not only farm species, but also culture systems, environments where it can be carried out. Here you can see a photo of a cobia farm uh, in the coast of Vietnam. I visited this farm uh, several years ago in 2014. Cobia is a marine fish. It's a fast growing marine fish and it can reach between three to four kilograms body weight within 12 months of grow out. And this is considered very fast. Um, we can also farm freshwater fish in dams or reservoirs using small floating cages, the same that you saw previously in the previous slide, but they're much smaller. Uh, this is a farm in the state of Bahia, northeastern part of Brazil. Brazil has a lot of hydroelectric plants, which are perfect for fish farming, freshwater fish farming. The main species used in this system in Brazil is tilapia. They can reach 800 grams up to 1.2 uh, kilograms within six months of grow out. Well, we are, have already spoken uh, a little about shrimp farming in the previous slides. These are earthen ponds in Thailand, away from the coast, using low salinity water. This farm has a salinity of around three parts per thousand. So shrimp farming is not carried out only on the coastal areas. They can also be carried out inland. There are hundreds of uh, inland shrimp farmings in Brazil and elsewhere. Some um, uh, shrimp species, like the white clad shrimp that we farm here in Brazil, they can tolerate a wide variation in salinity that can go from 50 parts per thousand to less than one part per thousand. So this species can grow very well under low salinity conditions. Um, so the main reason that farms are moving away from the coast to inland areas is because of the cost of land, specifically here in Brazil is the cost of land, which is driven by the competition with other coastal activities, mainly tourism. However, there are other issues, uh, which include pollution of these coastal environments, crowded sites, and these crowded sites, sometimes you have other activities being carried out, which also pollutes the water and this causes big problems to the farming areas because shrimp get sick, they get disease and uh, farmers start to lose their production. So this is a trend that we see in uh, marine shrimp farming uh, at a global level going inland. Uh, however, aquaculture is not only about fish and shrimp farming. For example, production of farm seaweed reach 32.4 million metric tons in 2018 and this is equivalent to about 13.3 billion us dollars seaweeds can be eaten it's very common in asia i've been to korea and they serve seaweeds during breakfast 
But you can also get the extracts like agar, carhagenin, alginates, and these extracts have several applications. They can be used in food additives, they can be used in cosmetics, nutraceuticals, medicines, they can be used as fertilizers, or they can be used in animal feeds. One interesting aspect is that seaweed, like other algae, will obtain their nutrients for their growth from the environment. So there is no need to feed them. There is no feed. They will just absorb the environment. And the same applies to mollusk culture. Bivalves are filter feeders, so they can obtain nutrients from phytoplankton available in water. Production of farm bivalve mollusk reached 17.7 million metric tons in 2018, equivalent to 34.6 billion US dollars. There are also a number of species that we might be able to see their commercial culture in the near, near future. That is the case of this species of spiny lobster. It's, it's farmed in countries in Vietnam and Indonesia, for example. Vietnam, they have an industry that it's worth about $100 million. However, they do what it's called fisheries-based aquaculture. They rely on the collection of lobster seeds in the wild. Well, recently, researchers at the University of Tasmania, Australia, have been able to close their, the life cycle of this species under confined conditions. So in the near future, uh, farmers will not need to collect seeds in the wild. They'll be able to, uh, animals will be able to span and hatch their eggs under confined conditions. Well, as I said, uh, aquaculture uses a very diverse number of species in different types of aquaculture production systems and environments like freshwater, brackish water, marine water, inland saline water. If we compare uh, aquaculture with other livestock animals, we can see that these land animals, only very few species are actually farmed. Uh, and that's not the case of aquaculture. We have hundreds of species being farmed. If we look from the consumer's perspective, it is very good to have such a diversified number of species that we can choose from. However, from, from the production side, this diversification is not good since the development of species specific farming technologies and strategies becomes very difficult. And what is interesting is that the number of commercially farmed species in aquaculture is actually growing. It grew from 472 species in 2006 to 622 species in 2018. And if we look at this graph on the right side, on the bottom of the right side of the slides, uh, the bulk of aquaculture production comes from fin fish, and that's actually the most diversified group within the aquaculture sector. They have hundreds of uh, dozens and dozens of different species commercially farmed. However, uh, if we look at the total production of fin fish, only 27 fin fish species make up 90% of the total fin fish production. So in general, if we look at, a, at the bigger picture, we have many farmed aquatic species, but only a few groups are actually relevant in terms of volume and value. Uh, this is a marine fish uh, broodstock center that I visited in Vietnam. Uh, in this center, uh, a few kilometers from the coast, and they basically keep sexually mature fish for spawning and uh, distribution of fertilized eggs nationwide. At the time I visited this facility, uh, I was able to count more than 25 different species of marine fin fish. So you can see how diversified in a single country, they farm 25 different species of marine fish. You can see how diversified it is. However, possibly only a few were uh, relevant to these that we see in the picture. Uh, grouper, snapper, uh, sea bass, and popano. In Brazil, it's the same case, uh, but in, in, in regards to the freshwater fish, we, we have more than 50 species that are commercially farmed in Brazil of freshwater fish. However, tilapia alone accounts for 57% of the total production in the country. 
Tilapia has a very fast growth, is tolerant to high stocking densities. You can farm tilapia up to 150 kilograms per cubic meter of water. So it's uh, quite resistant to these uh, intensive uh, uh, farming conditions. It also accepts well feeds, which are made of agriculture byproducts, such as soybean meal. And this is a species that achieves a very attractive price in the local market. So you might be asking, does aquaculture have any challenges? What are the areas of opportunity? Well, obviously there are so many challenges. One of the challenges is in the area of genetics. If we look at this diagram on the right side of the slide on the top, it's a slide that I collected on the internet uh, and it basically talks about uh, the growth of poultry over time in Brazil, what they have done with poultry. As you know, Brazil is one of the largest producer of poultry in, in the globe. In the 1930s, uh, it would take more than 100 days for a chicken to achieve one and a half, one and a half kilograms, and they would eat 3.5 kilograms of feed. In 2016, they were able to uh, achieve a body weight of 2.4 kilograms in only 40 days, eating only 1.6 kilograms of feed. So that's an example of, of what genetic can do uh, to livestock production. And we need the same uh, strategy being applied to aquaculture. Uh, and how can you do that? You can achieve that by selecting a species with this growth trait, uh, or you can develop that over time through a selective breeding program. Let's take, for example, these two species of marine fish. Uh, the one on the left is native to the Atlantic coast, the common snook, Centropomus undecimalis. And the one on the right is the Asian sea bass, Lactis calcarife, also known as Bahamundi. These species are related, but while the common snook grows at a rate of less than 0.4 grams per day, the Asian sea bass grows 10 times faster. So guess what? There is no commercial farming of common snook but there is commercial farming of the Asian sea bass, which is now widespread in many countries in Southeast Asia. So growth is very important uh, for aquaculture because you can do more crops per year, you can achieve greater yields in a year. So it's one of the main aspects for our candidate species for aquaculture is how much that animal, what is the growth rate of that animal? Um, well, uh, on the other hand, we can say that aquaculture is much more efficient compared to uh, the livestock uh, production of land animals uh, when it comes to the conversion of feed into animal muscle. Fish, for example, will retain more protein and energy from the feed compared to farm terrestrial animals like poultry, swine, and cattle. As you can see in this slide, fish will retain 31% of the protein from the feed, while retention for other animals ranges from 15 to 21%. The same applies to the energy contained in the feed. Fish will retain about 23%. Only cattle is higher than fish with a value of 27%, but both poultry and swine score lower energy retention values. What these figures mean is that fish needs less feed than other animals to achieve the same muscle growth. So we need 2.0 kilograms of feed to obtain one kilogram of poultry meat, three kilograms for swine, and between four and 10 kilograms for cattle. Uh, in comparison, fish requires only 1.1 kilograms of feed to achieve one kilogram of body weight. So we can produce 61 kilos of fish meat with 100 kilograms of feed, while other animals will produce at least three times less with the same amount of feed. Um, well, however, aquaculture is now facing what we call the protein gap issue. 
almost 70% of all aquaculture production today is done through the use of industrially manufactured feeds. Non-fed aquaculture, which refers to the filter feeding fish, such as some species of car and aquatic invertebrates, mainly bivalve mollusk, is not very big anymore as it used to be in the past. So the farming of other animals, such as fish and crustaceans, rely on feeds for their growth. So you need to buy the feed in order to grow them and culture them. The problem is that the manufacturing of feeds for some species, mostly salmon, marine shrimp, and marine fish, still uses fish meal as a protein source. And the reason, the problem behind that is that, um, um, first of all, the, the reason for using uh, fish meal is because it is a source of protein that is highly digestible. It also contains several essential nutrients that the fish needs, including amino acids, fatty acids, minerals. And fish meal also acts as a feed attractant. So it's a perfect ingredient to uh, feed fish and, and shrimp. However, where does the fish meal come from? And that's the problem. Most of it comes from the fisheries of pelagic fish, such as anchovy. About 18% of all fisheries landings at a global level is not consumed by humans. It's actually converted into fish meal and fish oil. And most of it uh, used as ingredients, uh, and most of this uh, uh, fish meal is actually used as ingredients in aquaculture feeds. Aquaculture will consume about 90% of everything that is produced from fish meal and fish oil at a global level. However, aquaculture has also been using uh, fish meal and fish from waste and byproducts from the processing of fish like tuna, sardines, uh, and also fish that are farmed like salmon, tilapia, and pangasius. So since capture fishery volumes of these pelagic fish is basically stable while aquaculture grows at a continuous pace, we need to find alternative protein sources. So how is aquaculture dealing with this challenge? The first thing is that feed manufacturers are significantly reducing the use of fish meal driven by the economy. Fish meal has become very expensive, but uh, there are also issues associated with sustainability, certification, and how uh, is the industry dealing with it? How, what's the solution? Well, feed manufacturers are actually replacing this fish meal the protein from fish meal for uh, protein for alternative proteins from other animals and uh, proteins that are, are that is obtained in agriculture. Uh, the conventional alternative protein sources to fish meal have been rendered animal byproducts that includes poultry meal, meat and bone meal, and also agricultural byproducts such as soybean meal. Uh, corn meal, canola meal, and concentrates. More recently, there are several companies investing in, in, in what we call unconventional protein sources. And these include insect meal, single proteins from microalgae and bacteria, and also seaweed protein. So very soon, we're going to start to see these raw materials replacing, at least partially replacing, some of the protein value that it's obtained in fish meal and also uh, in, uh, from fish oil. So this is likely to be a trend in the coming years. Well, uh, changing the subject, I'm not sure if you know the meaning of RAS. RAS stands for Recirculating Aquaculture Systems. Through a series of filtering devices, uh, a farmer is able to culture a species of fish or shrimp by treating the water effluent and using this effluent, this treated water, over and over several times. And there are several ways you can operate and set up a, a RAS, a recirculating aquaculture system, that really depends on the species you are raising and the biomass you're targeting. The traditional system, the traditional RAS system, aims at keeping the water clean with low concentrations of nitrogenal compounds. The problem is that the cleaner the water, 
and the higher the fish biomass, the more expensive the investment and the operational cost. So there have been very few economically feasible RAS operations worldwide because it's very expensive to operate it. However, now there seems to be a comeback of these RAS systems. There are several operations under construction at a global level, for, especially for Rian Salmon uh, under these conditions. Uh, near the main markets like uh, the USA and Japan. And the reasons why there is this comeback is because salmon prices are very attractive. There has been an improvement in the RAS technology. There is also an increase in the global demand uh, uh, for the aquatic protein. protein. Uh, and when you have the RAS, you can place it anywhere you want. You can have it just near the market. Uh, you don't have to transport the animal. You reduce the cost of transportation. And the biggest advantage of this RAS system is that besides the fact that they are more environmentally uh, controlled and you don't have disease uh, as we have in traditional systems because everything is controlled, everything is closed. You have full control. You have a better prediction of the risks and how much you're going to produce. Besides getting environmental licenses for operating cages in the sea is becoming more and more difficult. Well, there are also RAS systems for other species like tilapia. Tilapia, as I mentioned before, can be raised in a very high stocking densities. And these systems can be an alternative to areas where water is very scarce, like here in the northeastern part of Brazil. You don't have the option in these areas to use the water, to exchange water at a frequent uh, basis. So RAS can really serve for this purpose. Uh, aquaculture systems can also be operated on the minimum water exchange conditions. As a matter of fact, it, this has become a trend uh, in shrimp farming and in, in many uh, other aquaculture systems. And the reason for that is that there's so much pollution uh, and this causes uh, diseases and this causes the outbreak of diseases and problems during production. So farmers are developing uh, technologies to, if they have to exchange water, they do it at a minimum level or they do no water exchange at all. That's the example uh, of this shrimp farm in the state of Bahia. Um, so they do no water exchange at all. Uh, they use the water, they reuse the water several times. Obviously, operating uh, with low water exchange is not easy. Uh, there is a much higher demand for dissolved oxygen. And this dissolved oxygen needs to be artificially supplied, meaning that there will be greater operational cost. There is also the, the need to develop nitrifying bacteria that will, you know, take all the excess uh, nitrogen compounds in the water. Well, um, finally, I like to talk about the social contribution of, um, of aquaculture, and I'm going to talk about it making a reference to this slide. Uh, this, uh, I was involved, Labama was involved in a project that was financed by the European community and it was managed by FAO and there are several countries involved, there are 11 partner countries and Brazil was one of them. So it was a three year project, if I was not mistaken, and basically we wanted to investigate the social impact of aquaculture, especially to reduce poverty. Uh, so here in Brazil, we had to visit more than 100 households, uh, people that were directly involved with aquaculture. And what we found was very interesting. Those people that were involved with aquaculture, they would have a, a, a much better life uh, compared to those that were involved with other activities. Uh, there was a direct um, benefit of aquaculture driven by the fact that there was more fish available for consumption, so you're increasing uh, uh, food security. 
Uh, and also, uh, the, all the income that comes from aquaculture is actually reinvested in that same operation, which allows the expansion of that operation. Uh, so what we have found is that uh, there is a very positive social impact uh, in, in every one of these countries that were uh, that investigated the, the social impact of aquaculture came to the, came up to the same conclusion. And we need to realize that uh, 90%, 80 to 90 percent of aquaculture production comes from developing countries. So it does make a big difference um, having aquaculture. So I like to end with this statement from uh, a French, ocean explorer and engineer, uh, uh, Jacques Cousteau, and I'm pretty sure that most of you know who Jacques Cousteau is, but I'd like to end uh, with this statement and what he said, he was able to predict exactly uh, how, uh, what is happening today. And he said, we must plant the sea and herd its animals using the sea as farmers instead of hunters. That is what civilization is all about, farming, replacing, hunting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alberto. What's really an amazing uh, update about uh, aquaculture and uh, not only the world concept, but also this last trends in aquaculture. Later on, we will have some questions for you. Now we pass to the next speaker, which is uh, Professor Stefano Piraino. Uh, Stefano Piraino is an associate professor of zoology in the Università del Salento in uh, the Dipartimento di Scienze e Tecnologia Biologiche ed Ambientali. Uh, here in Italy, in Lecce. He has been working for many, many years with Nidarians. And uh, in the starting, uh, Stefano has been working in taxonomy, mostly in taxonomy, but step by step, he has been just uh, following different steps, different ways, very varied, I have to say, uh, about molecular ecology and uh, during the last times more uh, about, in some way, conservation, but also the impacts of Medusa in aquaculture and, for example, what we, he will talk today, that is, how can we use Medusa from another point of view or with another perspective? Just, it's all yours. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sergio. Thank you to, the, to all the organizers at the Fortaleza University. This is a great opportunity to celebrate uh, our recent uh, partnership uh, between our universities. And uh, I'll try now to let me open my, to share my screen. Yes, I think it's, uh, uh, okay. Should be. Perfect. Okay, I, hope, I hope that you see that. Yes. yes uh, your, my, your presentation is uh, of myself is, um, uh, I would not say I'm a taxonomist. I probably I described a few species, but uh, I think I started from out ecology, and I and uh, uh, probably I also work with some uh, synecological issues. Uh, but slowly I moved back uh, to, to cell biology, and I used uh, some reductionistic, more reductionistic approach to investigate ecological problems. Now today I will try to. Uh, to summarize some recent uh, updates uh, regarding the, the, the research that we we do in uh, at the University of Salento in, 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 our, in our lab, and of course uh, this is uh, the the title of the of the, of the this presentation is uh, uh, something that can show you there is a complementarity with. Uh, the, the talk given by Andre Morandini two days ago, and he made an excellent introduction to the to the issue of jellyfish outbreaks, which is growing, uh, is increasing uh, uh, the concern uh, regarding this uh, uh, expansion of uh, the frequency and abundance of jellyfish uh, uh, in world oceans. Um, today, I'll try to give you more uh, more po positive perspective of these gelatinous outbreaks 
and I'm happy. I'm I'm just uh, behind uh, the presentation by Alberto because there is a strong connection in terms of the exploitation of uh, new species uh, in terms of for, for for human consumption. I'm not going to only to talk about food, as you will see. So I'll try to open also some little windows uh, to explain. Uh, uh, some context more in detail. I, I remember that we, during the talk of André, uh, he mentioned something about uh, uh, some peculiarities of uh, jellyfish life cycles. And I want to explain because we were, we have been involved uh, very much in this, uh, in this research. Okay, so this is just to 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 recall to the people. Maybe someone was not here here uh, two days ago. So the, the 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 main problem is that there are more jellyfish around that uh, than before, and this is a map from the thesis of uh, PhD thesis of Lucas Bros, who collected information from coastal areas in worldwide. And uh, in this map, in the red and orange areas, there is a, a certain evidence uh, that there are a rise of jellyfish. So there are more jellyfish around the world. Uh, someone. Um, Say that uh, this was based maybe on uh, non-verified uh, uh, numbers, uh, or that it was just uh, a feeling uh, that was uh, probably also increased by the media uh, or by the public perception. Uh, I would say that, uh, and I will show you that there are some some evidence that in some coastal areas of the world there is certainly. Uh, evidence, a scientific evidence that, that there, are, there is an increase in abundance and frequency of, uh, of jellyfish worldwide. But it's also true that uh, I would say that a, a very important point is that regardless of uh, whether the jellyfish are really on the rise or not, we are using the ocean more and more. And this means that we have a probability and uh, of encounters with jellyfish outbreaks uh, uh, in uh, increasing uh, uh, occasions. So we need to, to deal with uh, some evidence. Uh, there, uh, and also, Andre mentioned uh, uh, a word that has been used by uh, some fishery biologists. Uh, they uh, explain, they try to, to explain this change in the uh, ecosystem from a fish-dominated ocean to a jellyfish, more jellyfish-dominated ocean together with uh, uh, gelativorous fish species. You can see mola mola, or you can see also sea turtles, or also the other, other species that uh, uh, do have a preference for jellyfish as food. So this shift uh, has been called as jellification. And uh, we really need to see whether this is uh, a fact, but uh, there are certainly evidence of uh, changes in some areas of the world. And this has been because there are some peculiarities in the, in the jellyfish life cycle that make possible for them to, to, um, to use a, a variety of strategies in the, in the life cycles so that make possible a, a extreme amplification of numbers of their population. Just from a single fertilized egg, this life cycle show you a, a, a little larva that go back to the bottom, go to the bottom and metamorphose into a polyp stage and which is able, the polyp stage is able to produce uh, many copies by asexual reproduction. And the asexual reproduction is so intense that very easily from a single larva settle on the bottom, you can find uh, uh, fields fully covered. And there is an estimation that a single wreck in the Adriatic Sea contains so many polyps that may produce a number of jellyfish that may cover the whole Adriatic Sea. Just to, to have an idea, this is from only from a single wreck, shipwreck. Uh, and you can uh, imagine so the potential for the amplification of the life cycle. Because from the polyps, I go back here, you see there are then a process of production of the jellyfish from a single polyp that can produce many jellyfish and many species can do that for many times and producing it many, many jellyfish. Uh, this make possible, for instance, for species like Aurelia, the moon jellyfish, and this is a species Aurelia cerulea that we recently redescribed and it was the 
uh, found uh, uh, more than 100 years ago for the first time. It was described in the uh, in the in Bay of uh, Sydney. Uh, it's uh, so of uh, in the Pacific in the Pacific area. Uh, but it's now probably the species that is more widespread in the world, it's the invertebrate more widespread in the ocean waters because it has traveled to, together with the Crassostrea giga, uh, the, the Pacific oyster, all around the world because uh, Crassostrea is what the, the best, uh, probably even the, 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 the most uh, uh, preferred oyster in, in the world. So it, uh, with the, on the shells, so you see here, there are polyps attached to the shells of, uh, of this oyster, and the oysters were uh, uh, now have been introduced everywhere in the water, in, in coastal areas of temperate waters. And for instance, in the Mediterranean Sea, 50 years ago, it appeared first in the, uh, in the French lagoons, and are now uh, uh, this Aurelia species, the moon jellyfish, is uh, populating. Uh, uh, all the coastal lagoon in the whole Mediterranean Sea. Uh, jellyfish are also, some species do not have a polyp stage, but they uh, also, they exhibit extremely uh, successful strategies like, for instance, uh, uh, cod ship, they can uh, release uh, the eggs in mucus ribbons, and so just a few males can fertilize uh, all the eggs uh, of, of a female. So the uh, fertilization success is very, very high. And uh, then some of them can be hermaphrodite. And this is, for instance, Nemiopsis, even if it's not uh, a scyphozoan jellyfish, but Nemiopsis is also a big concern is because it has produced a big impact on the fishery in many coastal areas in the world, particularly in the Black Sea, where it has destroyed the, the fishery of anchovies uh, in uh, during the, the 80s, because it has a potential and a, and a huge potential of sexual reproduction. So many, many strategies for sexual and asexual reproduction are combined in jellyfish. And so you can have a population which in a way or the other, in the polyp stage in the, or in the jellyfish stage or in, the, in a cyst-like stage on the bottom, they rest there and they can be, um, they can be uh, present in the, in the habitat. So able to exploit in an you know, opportunistic way the the, uh, the the best uh, options offered by by the habitat. Um, this is something also Andre Morandini mentioned that uh, it's a very successful group because uh, it's over 50 five, I'm sorry 500 million years uh, that the body uh, uh, shape and the the bow plan of the of the animals is not changed much. You see the uh, from uh, this uh, fossil record, the, the, the morphology of the jellyfish is not changed much. This means that there is a, certainly a very, it's a very successful group. But how much successful? It's so successful even to escape that. And uh, I, I took the opportunity because uh, you mentioned uh, two days ago about uh, something we work a lot and we are still working on and regard uh, the, what is called uh, an immortal jellyfish. Why I'm talking about it? Because in the, uh, a blue growth opportunity would be also, of course, uh, to, uh, to, to, to analyze, to, to see whether there are some secret of immortality. Uh, uh, my response is certainly not, because immortality uh, is not something that can be, uh, we, not, we do not have to search for immortality. It's uh, meaningless uh, in an ecological sense, uh, um, because life without death wouldn't be possible on this planet. Uh, but what is interesting, and I show you a, a little video, what happened in this jellyfish? This jellyfish is a, is a small hydrozoan jellyfish produced by uh, a polyp colony. And you see here the liberation of this uh, tiny jellyfish, which can be two, uh, two millimeters in, uh, in size, in diameters uh, at, uh, at maturity. This leaves uh, for a month or two in the water column collecting food and feeding on plankton. And uh, after that, so uh, it produces, uh, uh, it undergoes sexual reproduction, producing the meats. Uh, and this is a normal life cycle, would uh, end with the production of a, of a new larva. But in this case, uh, this animal is able to do something very different. 
This is an old video. You can see it from the computer and also from the young guy. This is me more than 20 years ago when a Japanese troop came in the lab to, to record and we reconstructed the life cycle of this jellyfish. Here I was in using uh, some uh, micro, was doing some microsurgery. Uh, um, so to, to make a, a mechanical stress on the jellyfish. There are several types of, of stresses on this jellyfish and the jellyfish go down to the bottom uh, because it's, uh, it cannot uh, swim anymore. And when it goes on the bottom, it produces, uh, it undergoes uh, um, uh, a very uh, unusual phenomenon. Normally uh, in this uh, situation, an organism would die. But what you see, you can see here is a time-lapse uh, reconstruction uh, occurring in more than, a little bit more than 24 hours, um, which uh, in, at least in the laboratory, we have observed that uh, these cells are the potential to completely remodel themselves. So, and the jellyfish uh, uh, body is dismantled to make a new uh, polyp uh, colony uh, uh, in uh, directly without passage from uh, any uh, sexual stage. So we have actually a reversal of the normal ontogeny. It's uh, comparable to, uh, if it, imagine to have a butterfly able to revert to the caterpillar stage. This is what you are uh, looking here. You have seen the body of a jellyfish, which is now settled on the bottom and it's reforming a, a completely different uh, structure that is the polyp. And this, from this uh, primary polyp, uh, new polyp will come up. And so a new, the, the colonies that we have seen in the first, uh, uh, steps of the uh, in the feast uh, in the first images of this video uh, will be reformed and since then new jellyfish will reappear so someone talked about uh, when we discovered this uh, potential uh, someone talked about uh, an immortal jellyfish again here we have the polyp stage with the medusa but and you also you have the the medusa so the the life cycle uh, at the same time you have together but uh, uh, there are many ecological and evolutionary advantages to have this uh, uh, this ability for reverse development but this uh, certainly not immortality because if it, this species would be really immortal this means that it would uh, fill the all the oceans and so it's something that we should uh, uh, disregard we do not uh, believe any anything about uh, potential immortality this jellyfish dies but they do not die uh, uh, immediately, so they are able to amplify the numbers of uh, the numbers in the population. And you see, there are many good reasons for for doing this because the population of the can can be very rapid. Uh, there is an ability to adapt and to decide that the, the species can rest in the polyp stage or in the so in the benthic habitat or in the uh, water column in the medusa stage, depending on the food availability in the two habitats. Uh, of course, jellyfish uh, make possible dispersal of the species. And uh, there is also with the jellyfish stage, which is the adult or, of the life cycle, it's, uh, there is ability to produce uh, genetic variability with bisexual reproduction. But uh, what is why is interesting? Why there might be an opportunity to, to have, so this is uh, the, the butterfly, there is no butterfly able to go back to the caterpillar stage. Uh, this is uh, the, 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 the life cycle of these jellyfish, which go back to the, uh, to the, the polyp stage. So there is a, a potential to uh, return to a juvenile or to, or let's say, to a stage preceding the adult stage. That uh, the polyp stage, someone defined as a post-larval stage, because the larva is the planula larva and the, the adult stage is the, the jellyfish. Uh, actually, we started this work in 1996 and uh, uh, analyzing the, poten the cellular potential of these jellyfish, uh, working with these tiny jellyfish, isolating different cell types and different cell layers to see what was uh, responsible. It was maybe just uh, a pool of undifferentiated cells. And we discovered something very interesting because uh, even well-differentiated cells, uh, you see the difference from uh, the, the jellyfish on the left and the jellyfish on the right. These are two different species. And on the left, we have our Turritopsis uh, 
Dorney uh, jellyfish, which is able of reverting the life cycle. And these uh, dots are the cells which are able to return into a cell replication sta state. Uh, on the other hand, the other, the other species is not able to do that. Uh, and uh, this is uh, because uh, the, there are potential, there is a potential for cell transdifferentiation. This means that uh, uh, these cells uh, can uh, uh, change their function and their morphology into a different cell types uh, uh, by direct uh, change, uh, that is trans differentiation, or through DNA uh, replication, which means by first the differentiation and then re differentiation. This is uh, uh, an interesting information concerning the that regards the understanding of how stem cells works and how it's possible for cells to maintain the stability of a differentiated cell, uh, um, differentiated state or to, to enter uh, again into a cell cycle. Um, and this is interesting from many even different aspects. This is the last paper we have produced on this aspect uh, that make, uh, was made possible by the new technologies. Now we have uh, transcriptome characterization of the different stages in the life cycle. And actually what we have is like uh, um, information of what are the molecular mechanisms which are that are uh, switching on and or switching off in the different uh, stages. And this will help to understand even the biology of uh, uh, of uh, our cells, because there are many uh, basic mechanisms at molecular level which are shared to control the stability of cell differentiation. So this is just an example how investigation, investing money to 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 work on marine biodiversity, which is largely unexplored, is a fundamental uh, to in, to give technological innovation and to to have. Uh, to promote applied science, because from this work, from, the, from a simple little jellyfish, we may have uh, information concerning, for instance, uh, uh, cancer development, concerning uh, pathology, neuropathology, uh, and many other um, uh, cellular processes where there is a, uh, out, uh, a change in the cell differentiation. Let's go back to the to the to the to our original, uh, to the, our main topic, that is, uh, we have many jellyfish, and there are so many that we maybe we want to use them in some way. This is a video that was played uh, on uh, was uh, was done in uh, along the coast of Israel, and the species is Ropilema nomadica, a jellyfish that entered from the Red Sea through the Suez Canal, and you see there it's a huge population, and every year these species form up to 500,000 tons of uh, gelatinous biomass traveling and cruising over the, along the Israeli coast and feeding on plankton even in, a, in waters the, of the eastern Mediterranean which are already very oligotrophic. So certainly channeling the, 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 the food web in a way which was not uh, known before. And this is something that started in 1976, when the first jellyfish was detected uh, in, uh, along the Israeli uh, coast. Um, this is what now the Israeli fishermen uh, find in their, in their net. But uh, um, the idea of a jellyfish in, the, in uh, the increasing along coastal areas is more clear now in the last uh, uh, 11 years so we have uh, we are running a citizen science initiative where people can uh, uh, send records of species and you see also that we had to adapt our communication posters to 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 because uh, uh, citizens or fishermen or everyone that is at the sea can identify one of the species in the poster. And there were only 13 species in the first poster uh, re representing the most common species uh, in the different area of the Mediterranean. Uh, now we have uh, uh, at least uh, 21 species uh, 
uh, that are uh, in uh, in the new in the new poster. Overall, we have recorded more than 500,000 records of jellyfish in coastal waters over the last 10 years. I don't want you to, to, to talk uh, more about the negative impacts of jellyfish outbreaks because this was already addressed by, by Andre, but I want to give you a, a hint of uh, how we can think about jellyfish with a more pe positive perspective. So the bright side of jellyfish outbreaks. And this is, uh, let's say that jellyfish in this way can be a paradigm to show how we should uh, behave uh, with uh, ecosystem changes because uh, they, we should use a different new vocabulary uh, to face with, uh, to adapt, to transform. That means that we have to exploit the new opportunities to produce uh, uh, food or feed. We have to produce drugs, cosmetics, and all the bioactive compounds that uh, can be a resource for, uh, for pharmaceutical uh, uh, companies. Um, new biomaterials and uh, uh, of course uh, uh, using different uh, biomasses like the jellyfish biomass make is uh, critical to uh, sustain a sustain for the sustainability uh, natural resources and to prevent the massive exploitation of uh, uh, of uh, protein so the traditional protein sources as mentioned by Alberto before uh, so, of course, uh, this uh, will be a driver, uh, exploitation of new resources will be a driver for the socioeconomic development, for sure. Uh, actually, I want to mention something about the Gold Jelly European project. This is uh, uh, the last of a long list of projects where we have been involved with different roles. And actually, through the uh, Institute of uh, Science Production, Food Science Production of the, the National Research Council, we are involved also in this last uh, Go Jelly uh, project, uh, which is addressing uh, particularly uh, this, uh, the task of identifying a nutraceutical from jellyfish biomass. That means uh, molecules that can be beneficial for humans besides be nutritional. So to uh, you know, decide to have to to in, include uh, to to have a nutritional effect, it can also beneficial because of uh, additional uh, effect. Uh, also to find uh, new processing methodologies and uh, to produce uh, also innovative uh, in brackets jellyfish-based foods. Um, there is also some other uh, objective in uh, in this Go Jelly project, and I want to mention the last one particularly that uh, jellyfish can be used as filters for microplastics. I want to show just a, a slide, and, uh, and then uh, uh, later in the, in the discussion, if someone will, I, I can also show a video concerning this aspect because it's uh, known now that the mucus as the propensity of jellyfish can have the potential to entrap. Uh, nanoparticles and so someone has of course uh, uh, not something that to be used in the wild but uh, the idea of uh, using mucus from jellyfish is to produce the filters to trap nano waste before they reach uh, the, uh, the the sea uh, the main issue, in a way, concerning the use of this enormous uh, biomass of jellyfish is that now we will have about 9.6 billion people that will have more food from the oceans. And we have seen how, from Alberto's presentation, how the rise of uh, uh, catches from the wild, from fisheries, is uh, decreasing, decreasing. Even if we are going deeper and deeper searching for fish, even if we are using uh, uh, higher technology, high technology to search for fish, even if we are using uh, uh, even methods for fishing like trolling, which are, are now destroying the habitats of, uh, of fish and will prevent the, uh, re possible, the possibility of using the same area for, uh, for fishery. Uh, actually, this is the situation in the last uh, 50 years up to the 2003, there was a decrease of about 30%. The dotted line in the graph show you that uh, near 2050, uh, there will be a total collapse of the fishery resources. So even if we see some a little increase in the fishery catches, so this is just because we are just uh, scraping the walls 
of the barrels. So, but uh, at, at the end, we will have nothing more to, to scrape. And this is actually the 28th, uh, the, the, not the last one or the, before this, the last one, is, the last one was 2020. This is 2018 report of, uh, of uh, FAO. Uh, and uh, more or less uh, the same numbers that were shown in the, in the other ones, uh, in the, in the report uh, shown by, uh, by Alberto. So actually there are about uh, from 50 to 60% of the fish population in the Western Atlantic, which are overexploited or collapsed. And uh, the statement is very clear that there have never been so few fish as now. Uh, and as you see, we are fishing more and deeper and deeper and deeper and different, different fish. Uh, this is, uh, I don't, it doesn't want to be a provocation for a uh, provocatory, uh, uh, question for it, it was something that we we can discuss with Alberto. Uh, I like the the the, the concept that uh, we, we have to move from hunting to farming, but the farming has not to be in this way. Uh, farming uh, in mangroves uh, led to the destruction of 30 million hectares of uh, the one of the most productive uh, habitats in the world uh, over the last 50 years. And uh, 30 million hectares means uh, more than about uh, three times Switzerland. Uh, and the, the rate at which uh, mangroves are, are still captured means that uh, in the next 20 years now, there will be no mangroves anymore. And if this is uh, farming, I, I would say, please stop. Uh, of course, there are many other less destructive uh, ways to do that. And Alberto gave us uh, some uh, beautiful uh, example, but we have to be uh, very careful of uh, supporting uh, uh, non-controlled uh, aquaculture, aquaculture, because it will not solve the the problem. This kind of aquaculture, uh, and this is what made made to to have uh, to have shrimps. So actually, we should look for new resources, and this is uh, some videos that uh, we ha have uh, uh, taken uh, in the last years. Uh, uh, you see underwater the number of jellyfish in an area which is a hundred kilometers apart from here, and uh, in the in the in the two uh, little um, images the, on the top of the slide, you see on the on the left uh, the lines of uh, we made. Uh, uh, a flight with an ultralight uh, aircraft uh, to check uh, on these coastal areas the situation. It was all the time was like the, and so then we went uh, in uh, the same day to check what we were seeing uh, from the flight. Uh, and uh, on the on the right uh, side of the slide, you can see the white dots uh, signed also by the the rounded. Uh, uh, red uh, rings, uh, which are jellyfish on the surface. And you see about uh, 50,000 jellyfish per square kilometer were counted in this way. A huge biomass uh, that is am amounting about uh, 300, 400 jellyfish biomass per square kilometer. So uh, amazing, amazing uh, uh, biomass, which is totally unexploited. Uh, actually, the idea of eating jellyfish is not new, and there are actually already uh, near 40 known edible species. More of them, than, or most of them, belong to a single order, the Rhizostome. These are jellyfish with short uh, tentacles. They have uh, all uh, solid oral arms in the centers, and they have a solid umbrella. So the texture is very th stiff, and they are mild. Uh, most of them are mild stinger and they have a large body. Some of them can reach even 100 or 150 kilograms. Uh, I, I'm thinking about uh, Nemopilema nomurei, the giant uh, jellyfish that lives in the Sea of Japan. Uh, actually, so the fishing and aquaculture in the world, it's uh, of course uh, made uh, more in the Eastern uh, countries. Uh, and uh, there is a certain um, uh, number of uh, of jellyfish, which are caught by, by fishermen, and particularly this aquaculture of jellyfish. So the jellyfish are harvested on land, then they, they, is a, they are released in embayments and collected after two or three months because they can ha have a, a, large, uh, a large growth. This is a good business, and the export or to, just to Japan from, uh, from China is about uh, 10,000 
uh, tons per year with more than uh, a business of uh, more than 25 million uh, uh, of US dollars per, per year. Uh, overall, this is a graph that's showing the global cash. These are uh, FAO data, which underestimate because the, the reports of many of the uh, small countries uh, where there is aquaculture is not reported there. So actually, there is a report is uh, that uh, there is now uh, about one million uh, tons of uh, uh, jellyfish landings uh, per, per year. And uh, this means a, bi a business that can reach up to a uh, hundred million dollars uh, per year. So there is a certain business everywhere. As you see, the red zones are scattered mostly over the, the eastern countries and nothing, almost nothing in the Mediterranean Sea and very few, very little in the, uh, in the Atlantic uh, uh, Ocean. Uh, the jellyfish fishery can be an example of subsistence economy. There are fishermen communities that switch seasonally to the uh, to the cash of to, the, to, to fishing jellyfish, uh, and they earn money. For instance, some fishermen community in Georgia are now earning more money from jellyfish uh, the jellyfish fishery than from shrimps. So the the times of forest camp are, uh, are now uh not uh, valid anymore so the the, the shrimps uh, fishery is collapsed because we have fish too much so it's a matter of sustainability and why jellyfish should be more sustainable of a shrimp because if i collect a shrimp i collect uh, the organism which is able of reproduction but if i collect the jellyfish the jellyfish is, is uh, certainly the sexual stage but there are also in the, in the bentos, there are also uh, stages of the life cycle which are able by themselves of asexual reproduction. So if uh, collecting jellyfish from the water column, I like to imagine is like, is like collecting an apples from the tree. I'm collecting the apples, but I'm not collecting the tree. The tree is on the bottom and the, uh, and the new and the, the, the polyps can be are the, the branches that grow every all the time and that can produce uh, new uh, new fruits. Uh, there are of course many issues to be established, and I'm, I'm trying to to be more quickly uh, regarding the uh, impact of the of uh, jellyfish fishery on uh, on the on the ecosystem. This is something that we have to investigate before. Uh, uh, having problems uh, of uh, over exploitation, of channeling in a different way uh, the uh, the energy uh, of the of the food webs. This is a different situation for the go jelly. This is our team, and uh, uh, actually, I want to 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 give you just a little uh, example of what we are doing concerning the. Um, the work on the Mediterranean jellyfish, presenting them as a potential resource for, uh, for as food. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very known that the jellyfish are watery organisms, but uh, there is also a component of uh, uh, organic matter, uh, which, and there is a high component of protein, and the protein is collagen, which is a highly valuable uh, protein. And the collagen itself, uh, uh, can be used, and there are already some companies in the world which are extracting jellyfish to uh, for uh, bio biomedical apl application. And there are also some patents concerning the application of uh, jellyfish collagen for the treatment of uh, rheumatoid arthritis and many other uh, uh, applications. The uh, CNR ISPA has also developed recently another patent, but this is concerned the uh, transformation of jellyfish for food, and I will tell you uh, now. The, in terms of uh, nutritional and nutraceutical value, in terms of nutritional and uh, nutraceutical value, the jellyfish have high antioxidant proteins. They contain uh, uh, proteins, uh, well, the, the collagen is certainly digestible and is a good, uh, uh, is a uh, also a good source of amino acids. There are many amino acids. Uh, uh, most of the essential amino acids are present in jellyfish tissue. 
the um, hydrolysis of a protein from gelatin produce uh, many peptides that have a, a high uh, antioxidant uh, activity and, and even uh, non-proteinic uh, uh, compounds uh, like phenols uh, have a very strong antioxidant activity much more than uh, some uh, uh, renowned extract uh, from plants uh, particularly also the in terms of caloric content there are low calories so uh, and particularly because there are low fat content but those fats that are present in the jellyfish tissue contains a high percentage of uh, polyunsaturated uh, fatty acids and uh, there is an optimal ratio of omega-6 and omega-3 uh, uh, acid so it's a matter then uh, how, what it's uh, the, uh, the the what it's preventing now to have a spaghetti with jellyfish in the restaurant. So uh, because we show that there is a evidence that they are even the Mediterranean jellyfish are edible. It's only a question of a matter of quality and and safety. Actually, the traditional jellyfish processing, which is the, has been developed in uh, the uh, uh, Asiatic countries, contains uh, pre, um, uh, um, a step uh, where there is a high concentration of a uh, halum, a metal, uh, which remain uh, to, to prevent uh, the growth of microbes in the, in the packages. And uh, even after washing several times, there, in, in, there is a high concentration of halum that remains in the jellyfish that you, if you go to China uh, or, and you eat jellyfish, uh, you should know that you are eating a high concentration of alum. If you eat it occasionally, it's, nothing, it's not a problem, but according to the European food safety regulation, uh, uh, the, the high concentration of alum contained in, in jellyfish uh, uh, produced in China can be toxic in long term. Uh, so actually there is a lack of food safety protocol and the processing methods is poor compared to the European standards. And another um, limit to the, to the, to, uh, to see one day in the market, something like this see already in Japan on the right side of the slide, you see uh, a leaflet that, that show you how to cut and how to prepare jellyfish that you buy in the market. Uh, but uh, we will see something like that in uh, the European market only when we will uh, overcome the, uh, the safety rule imposed by the European standard, uh, which relate to the actually jellyfish are considered as novel food. And even if uh, they are not novel in uh, uh, what well, they are traditional food elsewhere, there must be some regulate, there is a uh, new regulation uh, from since uh, 2015, which uh, require uh, make, uh, to have an investigation regarding the, the safety of, uh, uh, of uh, new uh, organisms to be used as a uh, new species to be used as food. Uh, in China, there is a consumption of jellyfish since uh, uh, many uh, years. Uh, at least uh, since uh, 2000 uh, before or after uh, Christ. Uh, and uh, I would say that also in the, in the Re Cucunaria, it's a, a book of a gastronomic book of the Roman Empire uh, in the first uh, century before Christ, Apicio Celio mentioned some urticas marinas, uh, Urticas marina that well, could be used uh, for, for cooking. And certainly Urticas marina was uh, referring to Cnidarians. Um, there is also the description of uh, Rizostoma pulmo, the, 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 the lung jellyfish, uh, so common in the Mediterranean, the Eastern Atlantic, uh, uh, that uh, described these pieces uh, possibly, very possibly, well, can be used uh, as food uh, here. And uh, it's highlighted here by yellow. So it's something that uh, is not a new idea to use jellyfish as food. Um, the, the question concerning what is traditional, what should be considered traditional or novel, if you think about it, the Mediterranean diet, and this is what we have today in the Mediterranean, the pizza, polenta, and uh, legumes, they are uh, 
chocolate pie, something that was uh, is now very common in the Mediterranean diet, but this is uh, now, but 500 years before Columbus here, there was nothing of that. So there was nothing of what we consider now traditional food. Uh, so this is something that came only before, uh, after the discovery of, of America. So th there is a long way actually to have jellyfish as food. Probably we are now in the final steps because uh, all the work that has been done in this in the, in the last year was related to the proper handling, to the laboratory analysis, uh, to uh, develop a pilot scale. Uh, it also involving stakeholders' involvement from fishermen to chefs and to produce a, a good design and a prototype for the this, for the use of jellyfish in the market. Uh, the the work in the lab was uh, very complex uh, related to the physiochemical uh, characteristic of the jellyfish, to the bioactivity on uh, on uh, on human cell cultures, to the safety parameters uh, because we have to exclude the presence of pollutants or microplastics or microbes over the presence of allergens, any allergens. So the, the work that has, been, uh, that has been done is quite long and it was, is, uh, I would say is really is very, very, very complex, but we are very close to, to find also a solution to the preservation. Actually, this is the, the topic of the patent uh, because there is a thermal processing that can solve the problem of using alum for the, for the uh, for the processing of, uh, of jellyfish. So to, to bring jellyfish on the shelf of the market, we should not use, uh, we probably, we will not use any more uh, uh, toxic uh, metals. So these are some of the data that are published in one of the recent papers produced by the group uh, in uh, the European Food Research and Technology uh, um, Research, showing that there is no change after the treatment uh, at 100 degrees, there is no change in protein content, phenolic content, and antioxidant activity. So there is no reduction in the value of the jellyfish biomass. We have also shown that there is some anti-cancer activity. So there are uh, nutraceutical effects that are the compounds uh, uh, contained in jellyfish. And this is particularly, this is Cotylorhiza tuberculata. And I encourage you to uh, increase the studies on uh, other symbiotic uh, um, jellyfish with symbiotic algae, like uh, Cassiopeia samahana or Cassiopeia andromeda, because they contain extremely interesting compounds. This in terms of antioxidant activity or because they can be cytotoxic compounds uh, against uh, um, tumor cells. Uh, a final step was to involve chefs. So from the lab to the chef. And we started in 2015 with the Universal Expo in Milano. Uh, with, uh, where there was a, a, an ex universal expo on food. And so we had a session on novel food with five star chefs involved there and also some local chef, uh, high quality uh, chef. Um, this uh, has uh, got a good publicity uh, all, all over the world. And uh, recently we had uh, the visit of the Al Jazeera TV that there was on the air uh, with, a, with a program that was on the air the, the June, in June 2019. And more recently from uh, television of Hong Kong and uh, the program will be on air pretty soon in the next uh, uh, months. And actually very soon will be available and please send, you, send me an email or to Antonella Leone an email. You will receive a copy of a cookbook which is now in press. Uh, we have uh, 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 European jellyfish cookbook. So there are recipes which are adapted to uh, the Medita Mediterranean Western style of using jellyfish as, uh, as food. Uh, this work uh, has involved also uh, small and medium enterprises, and there was a, a, a food company, San Pietro, that was involved in the scaling up uh, of a pilot system for, to produce jellyfish in specific condition to um, maintain them for uh, for some time to make make it uh, make them to make them as a marketable uh, product. 
uh, we also tasted the possibility that uh, uh, we have, of course, so you need to create also a market, and the market, of course, uh, in a uh, in a need a, a habit, a need that you have a, a culinary culture related to specific food. So we made also uh, an online service that there were more than. Uh, uh, 1,400 respondents of Italian cities of different age and culture. And you see the output that were the people that was more, uh, uh, had a positive attitude to use jellyfish as food were young people with a low BMI, frequent traveler with high education and particularly living near the sea. Much more than our elderly people, or the people that li are living far from the sea because they are not used to see the strange things of of the sea, and, and you see also many people also declare that they would like to to eat them as ingredient better than inside. Living people living near the sea, this is uh, critical. Also to explain how uh, what is the attitude of people like fishermen. This is an example of fishermen that uh, in uh, in a very in village nearby our place, and you see here from in this video. This is what is uh, happening uh, one day where they catch many jellyfish, of, of course, uh, spoiling the net, but they were not throwing away the jellyfish. They were keeping them. And uh, the idea is that they were, trying to, they were trying to use it. And indeed, you will see by yourself, uh, actually, I want to hear that you hear, uh, you will see now we, we have interview with the fishermen. Okay, so this is a clear example of uh, the popular wisdom uh, to deal with the opportunities offered on, from uh, from the from the our habitat and from our environment. So this is exactly the the concept of uh, sustainability. So I think that I should stop. I talk a lot, probably too much, uh, and I hope that uh, at least I raise uh, your curiosity for these beautiful animals. Thank you. <clears throat> Sergio? Yes, thank you very much. Indeed, uh, Stefan was a, a very brilliant and clarifying, uh, complete set of, of knowledge about uh, jellyfish. What is clear is that you just uh, put on the map the jellyfish. And this is important because, as you said, we have to, fortunately, unfortunately, we, we do have to adapt. To, to new situations and to to just try to to make as good as we we can the the the, the you know follow this kind of, of 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 steps now medusa are also part of the of the possibilities and we have to just try to do as 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 good as we can with the treatment of these uh, cnidarians so now i will introduce you to the last uh, speaker which is uh, uh, professor David Ulises Santos Vallardo, who has uh, is an associate professor in the Universidad Politécnica de Sinaloa, and uh, he has been in, in Barcelona in the Universitat Autónoma de Barcelona, making the PhD. After that, he he went to Mexico again and started to make his uh, teaching, but also his uh, very profitable uh, work about alternative energies in general. But in particular, he will talk about one of the topics that he dominates very well, which is biofuels in general, biogas, biodiesel, uh, in which he has been uh, working during, during, the last, uh, during the last year and is one of the main targets of his work. David, is now the showroom is for you. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the presentation and for the, the opportunity to be here uh, talking about this important uh, topics. 
I think um, this uh, blue growth is is very important in the in the future in the future of the the economic in the world. I will speak about the microalgae um, and why the microalgae can be an important uh, can be can have an important participant in the blue growth. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, I, um, I, I'm, I'm from Mexico. I'm working the Polytechnic University of Sinaloa. Uh, specifically, I work in the en energy engineering and the master in, uh, in applied science. We are working with the, with the renewable energies and biofuels. In this presentation, uh, I will talk about a little bit of the energy context and why this energy context uh, promote the use of biofuels and what is the opportunity of participation of microalgae in biofuels and where or why uh, it turns from the target uh, of biofuels only and transforms in a biorefinery bio production. So, um, for the start uh, the presentation, I will talk uh, about um, the global energy situation. Uh, nowadays, uh, it's considered that the energy generated in the world is not enough to satisfy the, the energy demands of the world. And that's why we say that we are in a energy crisis now. Um, the, the slide shows the total energy consumption uh, by economic groups, by countries, uh, and we can see that the countries with greater economy, with, with greater economy and technological development, demands more energy. It means with the increment of the technology, uh, the needs of energy are, are greater e every time. Um, this situation of the crisis of energy uh, mainly is caused because the countries in the medium high uh, medium high levels in the economic groups uh, grow more than the predicted so these countries uh, ab advanced more in the economic and technological development so needs more energy than the predicted so the energy or the capable uh, production of energy it's is not enough to satisfy the the, the needs of the world and what are the possi possible uh, sources of energy? We have renewable energy and non-renewable energy. Why uh, even we have these many options for energy generations uh, in general, in almost all the world, the principal sources of uh, energy are from non-renewable energy. The, we can see that almost three parts of the energy are generated by coal, natural gas, and oil. It means almost 75% um, of the energy production in the world is generated by non-renewable energies. Here we can see also that nearly one third of the energy comes from oil directly. Oil, um, this, structure of the energy productions uh, promotes that as we need more energy, uh, the oil demands will be higher every time. The forecast to 2030 is considered con that we will need more oil. Uh, why happened this? Because the oil is the most convenient fuel. Um, when I say most convenient, we can say that uh, is the most um, effective, uh, is the most efficient uh, in performance in the electric generation and transportation. Uh, also, the cost even have some uh, problems in the cost uh, is the most uh, uh, profitable. But what are the disadvantages of this oil? Um, well, the first of all is the generation of atmospheric emissions with high high environmental impact. It means uh, all these problems with the the extensive use of the oil 
uh, are related with some changes in the environment. Uh, other point is the, the the oil reserves are finite. It means uh, it's considered that nowadays we reach the peak of production of the oil. Uh, so uh, the production in the future will be lower every time. Uh, I will try to not to confuse you and alarm you that the oil will end soon. The oil, the reserve of oil that we have, uh, I think will will last many, many, many more years. But in some point, the, these reserves are, are finite and they will be finished. So uh, in the future, when the reserves tends to diminish, the cost will tend to be higher every time. So um, as we see here, we are addicted to oil. The world is depending for fuel, for energy production, almost only for oil. Uh, it's, it's our responsibility to make a change, to find another energy sources that help to complete the use of the oil. Um, this transformation, this change is not uh, mainly by the problem of the finite reserves or um, by the economic uh, of the uh, economic changes of the price of the of the fuels uh, mainly the principal uh, and alarming situation now is uh, related to the climate change uh, this climate change uh, is related with intensive droughts with the polar ice caps melting um, with ocean acidification all these uh, situations uh, represents an, a, a big a big risk to the environment and to the way of life almost. This climate change is related with the increasing population, increasing technology, so the higher demand of energy and this use of the, these needs of energy uh, are together with more use of the oils. And these oils, um, combustion of the oils, uh, promotes uh, an accumulation of the, of, the, of the some gases that produce the climate change. So we are making uh, these problems because our needs of energy. So what uh, we have to do search alternative energy sources. Uh, between these alternative energy sources, we have many options, but we have a special interest in the biofuels. Biofuels are obtained, uh, could, could be solid, liquid, or gaseous, uh, and these are obtained from or, of organic matter biomass. Um, we have many different feedstocks available to use to product biofuels. We have lignocellulosic materials. We have the oil seeds crops that plants with high contents of sugars or plants with high contents of oils. Also emerge here the algae or the microalgae as an optional feedstock. We, um, there are many researches in the production process to obtain the biofuels. The principal biofuels uh, are the biodiesel, are the cellulosic ethanol, the biogas, and other components to, to make heat. The principal end uses for these biofuels are transportation, heat, and electricity. These three uh, targets of the energy of biofuels are very important for the level of life that we have as society. It means the transportation, the electricity, and the heat, I think nowadays is, are considered la, uh, like vital activities, not only for the, for the people, but also they are important in the economic uh, part of, the, of, of this talk. <clears throat> the biofuels we can uh, separate in primary biofuels and secondary biofuels. The primary biofuels, there are there are biofuels with uh, little processing. Only we have uh, compressing or 
diminish, uh, diminish the, the, the size and usually are used for heat. Uh, in the secondary biofuels are products that need more processing, processing like chemicals, biochemicals, like enzymatic processing. And the, and the secondary biofuels are, can be used for electricity, transport, and also for heat. Between these uh, secondary biofuels, uh, we can say or separate in generations of biofuels. These generations are classified in order or appearances. Uh, for example, the first generation are the biofuels generated by mm, food products. We can, he we can see here the, the mice, uh, the corn of the, for, for production of bioethanol in, in USA. This is the principal biomass used for, for bioethanol. In Brazil, we have uh, the principal product like sugar cane used for bioethanol productions. This first generation uh, has some advantage, um, like there are crops very used the, the people know how to, to have a good growth of these products. So the, the, the performance of the transformation is very good, but we have here an ethical problem. We have here, uh, there are many countries, uh, including Mexico, when thinking in use the, the food for energy production, it, it means it's problem, it's, it's considered a problem. Due to this, is generated the second generation. The second generation of biofuels is produced using some plant materials, but that they are not foods. They are not used for 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 food purposes. We have here the hatrofa, the miscanthus, the palm oil. Uh, this generation uh, attack the 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 ethic problem for use the food for for energy production, but uh, it indirectly compete with food uh, productions because for production of these plants, we need land, we need water that can be used for food productions. So these two generations uh, shares the, the competition for using the food or the spaces for growing food for energy generation. Here, emerge the third generation. The third generation of the biofuels is focused in the microorganisms. Uh, here, the principal actor in the third generation is the microalgae. This microalgae presents some properties that, that, that shows uh, or promotes as a potential source of biofuels. The microalgae are unicellular and simple photosynthetic microorganisms. These um, exist a very high number of different species available for growing. Um, basically, uh, we can classify as microalgae all the microorganisms to present photosynthesis. So we can have here uh, eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. Uh, the classification of the micro microalgae is very high. So why are there, why are they uh, important for bio biofuels production? Well, they have high growth rates and uh, they are very efficient in the photosynthesis because they have simple structures. The higher plants uh, presents organelles and different mechanisms uh, and the energy is use it in different ways. The microalgae is focused in develop the photosynthesis and do it this, their simple structure presents a high efficiency. Uh, they are considered as very versatile products because they can grow in fresh water, they can grow in marine environment, also they can grow in waste waters, uh, they can take the nutrients for the residual water, waters of the of the society. So uh, we have we can we can have uh, diverse options for make the cultures of microalgae. Also, there are there exist 
a high number of different species. Uh, it's considered that only one third of the available microalgae reported have been studied extensively. So exists a very high potential for more research of different species to, to a characterization and uh, validate the potential use for biofuels or another uh, compounds obtaining. Um, the principal characteristic of the microalgae that switch the interest that uh, for bio biofuels production is because in some certain conditions, some species can reach almost 70% of lipids by weight. It means that all, if all the biomass, we can have a high percent of lipids. These lipids can be used for biofuel generation, specific biodiesel. Due, due to these in, interesting characteristics, the microalgal research interest is very varied. We can have um, bioreactor designs because depends on the bioreactor, we can have a better growth rate, a better biomass accumulation. Yeah, it means more oil available for, for biodiesel. Um, the culture conditions, uh, it's very important this part because uh, the microalgae uh, reacts different to the culture conditions. So if I change the, the medium or the growth medium of the microalgae, they can react uh, accumulate, accumulating more components, more lipids or more starch or more sugars or more antioxidants. So it's very important to research the effects of the culture condition in the profile of the, of the microalgae biomass. Another um, research interest is the species isolation. As we say, we have a high variety of microalgae, but we can find more and more species. Um, the biomass harvest is one important topic because it's considered one of the most uh, costly part of the process. We are working here with microorganisms, and this, is, this represents that uh, it's difficult to separate the cells for the for the medium of growth. The growth monitoring is very important too because here we can control an adequate growth rate of the microalgae and we have to we can take decisions for harvest or for making more inoculum. And also the biomass processing is another part of the of the economically analysis that we have we can we have to make because the processing of the biomass to transform in bioproducts, this part could be uh, expensive. Uh, regarding to microagricultures, we can have two different bioreactors. Uh, the first of uh, this is closed bioreactors. Here, the microalgae are separate from the, for the environment. We have uh, enclosed the, the culture cells uh, here we can separate in two types, the indoor condition and outdoor condition. The indoor condition um, uses artificial light, uses artificial environment climate. So the efficiency of the growth rate in this indoor closet bioreactor is very high, but the cost of the process to maintain the artificial light and to maintain the temperature could be uh, impossible to, to generate a product with a, with a competitive cost. And the other closed bioreactors could be the outdoor. When we have the bioreactors uh, and use the temperature of the, of the environment, and we use the, the solar light for, for the photosynthesis of the microalgae, this um, could be a little less efficient in the growth rate but we we in the part of the cost of the process is very is is is, is an improvement very important and the other reactors available are the open ponds these open ponds are the most used in massive scales 
uh, it means that uh, here we don't have separating the, the microalgae from the environment. We have here higher volumes of, of microalgae available, but the risk of contamination is also important. And the, the growth rate and the number of cells is, is lower than the closed bioreactors. But uh, it represents an opportunity because the investment, initial investment is, is way much lower. So uh, many enterprises that work with microalgae uses this because the cost of for start the production is lower. About the culture conditions of the microalgae, we can have here uh, different parameters that affecting this growth rate. Uh, first of all is the nutrients. The nutrients, we uh, they need um, some chemical compounds like nitrogen, phosphorus, in, force, in forms of nitrites and phosphates. Uh, they need the CO2 for developing the photosynthesis. They, have, they need some vitamins and some minerals so for internal um, biochemistry in the cells. Uh, it's important to comment here that these nutrients, uh, you can make it in, in artificial way. You can put it artificial in the, in, the, in the growth medium, but they can take it also from natural sources. For example, in the, in the, in the waste, uh, water waste, uh, they can take this inorganic compounds from the contamination, from the contaminated water. Uh, when they grow, they consume these contaminated compounds. And also we have, we have or generate here um, a diminish or diminution of the contamination in the, in the water. This is a, a important part in the culture of microalgae. Another point uh, important is the aerations. The aerations um, is developed in the culture because uh, we, we have to promote the CO2 available for developing the photosynthesis. Uh, there are many studies when they use or they establish the culture of microalgae nearly to factories when they have an important um, production of CO2. And this CO2 can be used directly for growth the microalgae. Uh, we have here a more efficient growth of the microalgae. Also, we, we have um, an important consumption, consumption of the CO2 that, it, that it, we will go to the, to the environment. Um, the agitation here is important in the in the culture conditions because we have here uh, in the when we have a high biomass concentration, the color of the culture tends to be dark. So the light can cannot reach the center of the bioreactors. So this agitation allows the distribution of the light for all the cells. The microalgae root processing is very interesting. Uh, we have here um, the steps for process the, of the microalgae biomass to, to transform this in products. Uh, the cultivation parts, we, we talked it before. We, we can have autotrophic cultivation, heterotrophic, mixotrophic, depending on the source of CO2 that the microalgae can use, and several types of photobioreactors. And the, this part that I marked in red uh, is very important because the processing of the microalgae is in this part. So this uh, marks the prices, the final price of my product. In, in the harvesting that we told that there are, represents an important uh, opportunity to diminish the cost. We have the, the filtration, centrifugation, flocculations. For example, the centrifugation technique is the more efficient way to harvest microalgae. But if we think in a massive production of thousands of liters of microalgae, uh, centrifugation could, be, could represent a, a problem because 
I will need more energy and one equipment very high and expensive to make this separation of the biomass. So it's looked or uh, is ne needed or desired the development of these techniques, uh, passive techniques like flocculation, like flotation, when I use less energy. About the disruption and extraction methods, uh, we have physical, chemical, the use of solvents for extraction of the lipids. Uh, here we, we have an opportunity too because, because the, the process, for example, in the solvent extraction is necessary to dry the biomass. This dry is another expensive process. Um, for example, exists nowadays uh, some conversion process like transesterification in situ or uh, that don't need to dry the material. If we can uh, improve the cost of this process, the microalgae products could compete better with the with the fossil fuels. Regarding to conversion process, we have chemical conversions, uh, conversions, thermochemical, biochemical, uh, very high uh, variety of options. We have transesterifications, we have pyrolysis, we have fermentations, anaerobic digestions to transform the biomass to biofuels. Here, the products, uh, the main products are the biodiesel, bioethanol and biogas. Um, the potential uses of micro microalgae have been changed. Uh, the initial interest was as energy carriers because these high contents of lipids, many uh, research have been done for biodiesel potential to extract the lipids and transform to biodiesel. Also, there exists microalgae that produce more sugars, so they search the production of ethanol. Um, also, in anaerobic digestion or dark fermentation, the production of methane and hydrogen as energy carriers. Uh, this was the principal interest, but the research has been changing this because they can they find the 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 different research find that there exists more potential uses of microalgae. They also accumulate carotenoids, uh, proteins, antioxidants, omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. So these uh, potential uses change the, the target of the, of the microalgae technology. Uh, one example of this is the the case of one uh, specific um, microalgae, Ametococcus pluvialis. These microalgae seals uh, grow normal. They are green because the chloroplasts and the photosynthesis that they do. Um, but the interest of, from this microalgae uh, have a high growth rate. And say uh, the, the, the researchers say, I will try to check to change the culture medium to 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 analyze the potential for obtaining of, of lipids. When in these studies, they they observe that the change of the microalgae uh, change. They turn red, and they find that no more not an important increment in the lipid content, but they find uh, an accumulation on, the, on astaxanthin. This astaxanthin is a powerful carotene antioxidant that have a high value commercial. So in this experiment, they, they see the opportunity to generate as a target product, the antioxidant and as a second product, we can use as for the energy carriers. Um, how works the energy transformations from microalgae? Well, uh, it's kind of simple process. Uh, we have the 
the culture of microalgae. We have we have we can use artificial or natural light. We can use closed or open ponds. Um, when we have the biomass, we have to separate uh, this effluent. We can use it again in the inoculum, or we can dispose it uh, to the environment because uh, they are only water with with salt. Um, the biomass can be used for production of different energy sources like biogas, bioethanol, biohydrogen. But the principal interest are the oil because this property of the microalgae is that can accumulate high uh, lipid content. So the one of the option is separate the oil and pro biodiesel production. Uh, generating a biodiesel, the, the target product, and residual biomass. This residual biomass, the fatted, uh, with, without the lipids, we can use it again for another production of, bio, of energetic productions. What are the advantages of using the microalgae for energy production? Well, microalgae can use seawater or residual waters, and this allows to not attack the water for human sources. So um, also they not compete with the land available for food. It means that this biofuel will not compete with the food production for the society. Um, certain species can be harvested daily because they have a high growth rate and all the year here uh, is important and we discuss it many times. It's important because uh, we have many species of, of microalgae that can grow at different specific temperatures. So we can uh, have a pool of, of microalgae that can be used depending on the season of the year. In the, in the summer when the hot is uh, high, we can use these microalgae. In the winter when the temperatures go low, we can we can have or we have to, to find a species of microalgae that grow good in this part of the year. This could be allowed or this could um, allow to maintain a product all the year, not like the other uh, biofuels sources that many of them depends of the are seasonal seasonals of the of the season of the year. Uh, also, uh, different studies show that the microalgae have a high oil, high oil yield per area. It means that in a lower space, we can generate more yield, more oil than other sources, uh, plant sources. Also, the biofuels, the biodiesel and biogas and bio, bioethanol is considered not toxic non-toxic to the environment and is highly biodegradable. Uh, another advantage is that this efficient uh, photosynth in photosynthesis process of the microalgae um, allows to consume high quantities of CO2 to be used in the photosynthesis. So when they grow, we, we can uh, diminish the, the presence of the CO2 to the environment. Um, even it had the microalgae technology chose some advantage, there exists also disadvantage. The, the, the principal disadvantage are the, that the small size of the microorganism makes that the harvest is relatively costly. So this process is sometimes covered the half of the product or the final product, the cost of the final product is, is almost here in the harvest process. <clears throat> the, um, some process or uh, some technologies for using the microalgae requires to dry the biomass. So it contains a large water content and this, is, this could be a problem in the, the processing of the microalgae. Uh, usually, it requires a higher capital cost and it requires a, for experts to measure an intensive care for the process. So the, the cost of the, of the process could be higher again.
Um, is necessary the optimization of biomass harvest and lipid extractions. These processes are key in the in the in the transformation of microalgae to to biofuels. Um, nowadays, it's considered uh, are not you know, economically viable the the biofuels from microalgae due to these reasons that we talked before. And also one of the principal reasons of this is that a large proportion of the biomass is wasted. Um, for example, if we have a 50% of oils in the biomass and we separate to biodiesel transformation, the other 50, if I don't use the other 50 parts of the biomass, I'm, I'm, I'm wasting a large proportion of the biomass that have a cost to produce. Uh, what we need to do, to do or what we what is need to attack to improve the microalgae process. Um, first is reduce the cost and energy of the process in general. It's better to use uh, our natural light, to use CO2 on nutrients with with lower cost for reduce the, the cost of the process. And in one part uh, important is the use of byproducts. How can be, how can use these byproducts? Um, here is when uh, emerge the, the concept of biorefineries. Uh, a biorefinery um, uses uh, in an integral way, all the biomass for production of different uh, valuable compounds. Uh, we can have here the biofuels, functional foods, bioactive comps, chemical compounds. Um, these biorefineries uh, uh, allows the use of all the biomass to produce in chain two or three products that will generate uh, um, and a positive cost of my product uh, final. Uh, we, we, we speak uh, about the application of microalgae and um, we focus on the, on the biofuels, but exist many other applications. Um, the research allows to know more uses. For example, the biomass, the full biomass are used in animal feed in aquacultures because they, they they form part of the change the food change in the water food change uh, the with high contents of proteins with high contents of polyunsaturated fatty acids uh, they can also use it as biofertilizant uh, we can have here a huge quantity of value added products uh, like i say the PUFAs, the polyunsaturated fatty acids, uh, we have antioxidants like like uh, catalases, uh, tocopherols. We can get vitamins, different kinds of vitamins. We can have pigments and carotenoids like the astaxanthin, uh, the chlorophyll, the beta carotene. We we can have here another compounds like amino acids, antimicrobial compounds, proteins, carbohydrates. These uh, wide uh, options, number of options makes uh, or improves the possibility of using microalgae. Also, when we use residual waters, we can make the wastewater treatment. It means when we grow the microalgae cells, we can treat the residual waters to previously to uh, to dispose of on in the water corpse so uh, we can separate this application of microalgae in conventional and non conventional for example the conventional applications so, uh, is related with we have been talking uh, we have the waste uh, wastewater the residual waters uh, effluents sea water saline waters we can have nutrients or flu gases to provide the co2 to the microalgae and the the, the these cells 
use the sunlight and the CO2 to generate oxygen that could be could be uh, uh, in the environment. Also, we make wastewater treatment. We contribute with CO2 mitigations, and we are recycling nutrients. With this pro pro process, we generate the microalgae biomass. This microalgae biomass has to be downstream or has to be processed. Uh, we talk about the harvesting, the drying, the extraction of compounds, the purifications. This uh, processing has to be done. And we have two conventional applications. One uh, could be the biofuels that we are uh, speak, biodiesel, bioethanol, the methane, the bio oil, biochar. This can be uh, produced from the intact cells or make uh, making after the extraction of the lipids or the carbohydrates of the or or the organic matter uh, the other conventional application is the value added uh, value products here again we can use the intact cells or parts of the cell if we product one biofuel the rest of the compounds we can use it for as uh, products like nutraceuticals pharmaceutical compounds, bioplastics, feed supplements. So this conventional application have been uh, studied for many years. So we can have, we can find process that uh, efficient process for production of biofuels and added value products. Um, however, it's necessary to develop uh, another applications. Uh, here we can find the non-conventional approach. Uh, when we have the input, we we know the input, wastewater, microalgae, illuminations uh, as input of the biorefinery. And the products, the output, we can have the biofuels or the valuable compounds. Mm, within these non-conventional applications, we can find three principal areas, uh, the use as biosensors, the use in nanotechnology and the use on green in green vault buildings. This uh, non-conventional approach is an opportunity to generate another value of the microalgae. For example, in the biosensor, the, they use the, the spectro spectrophotometric characteristic of the microalgae to develop equipment for detection of toxic compounds, for detection of variations in, in some mediums like variation in pH, variation in temperature, because the microalgae reacts to the conditions and they show variations in the in the spectrophotometric patterns. So the, they can use it, this characteristic for develop equipments of high quality for biosensors. Regarding the nanotechnology, we, we can uh, use the microalgae because um, it they accumulate compounds like antioxidant, like uh, pigments that can be used for the transformation of nanoparticles. Uh, these nanoparticles need to be uh, characterized because using the microscopy technology and the application could be in like antifungical, antimicrobial, and could be used also in as antibiotics. So this uh, nanotechnology or this use of the microalgae it responds to the extensive use of nanoparticle products with uh, need high temperatures or high contaminant residuals. If we use the microalgae for development of nanoparticles, the impact of these products could be lower. Another interesting approach is the green buildings. The green buildings, uh, we have a, an example in, in Germany, when they use bioreactors in the structure of the building. These bioreactors accumulate a growth of biomass of microalgae. These microalgae can be used for production of non-energetic use, but also can be used uh, to generate biogas. This biogas can be used for the heating and electricity of the same building. 
So this makes that the building needs uh, less energy than other buildings in the in the area. Uh, these three uh, conventional and non-conventional approach uh, is necessary to to be more research in these topics. Um, I will talk a little about uh, attempt of microalgal biorefinery. We have uh, this work um, published in 2015 uh, when they uh, use Dunalia tertiolecta species of microalgae for obtaining uh, beta carotene, phytosterol, and fatty acids um, as the main product. They are producing bioactive compounds and with the residual biomass, uh, they use it for uh, fast py pyrolysis and produce bio oil and char can, that can be used for energy, for uh, the, bio, the bio oil can be used as biofuels and the char can be used uh, application uh, like um, fertilizant. Connecting this uh, production of valuable compounds and gen generation of bio biofuel and another uh, product. Um, another example is this work that we realized, uh, our group work, in 2015. Um, here we try to valorization of uh, the, the wastes or originated in biodiesel bio production of tetracelmi suesica biomass. Here, the, the goal of this work was to generate the microalgae biomass, make the oil extraction and transesterification for biodiesel production that, that could be used for transport. But uh, the solid microalgae defaded biomass, uh, the residual biomass, we use it for, for analyze the potential of biogas production. Um, also, we tried uh, to use both residual of uh, originated in the biodiesel production during transesterification of the, of the oils, of the lipids, to transform in, in biodiesel, also generate the glycerin. So we try to compare uh, the production of biogas of, of a co-digestion of these compounds. Uh, this biogas could be used uh, as a source, a source of energy, electric energy and calorific energy. This uh, energy is, it was thinking, it was thinking, to, for use in the same process of the of the biodiesel to make a product more uh, with a better economic performance. The results are very interesting because uh, the productions generated for the microalgae residues alone was much lower than the co-digestion of the of the residual biomass and glycerol. Uh, it, it was found uh, an increment in nearly to 200% in the biogas production when we use both residuals of the, of the process. <clears throat> Another uh, work of, the, uh, of, of our group work uh, is the analysis of the microalgae residual of Phydactylum trichornotum, and we try to analyze the chemical composition and physicochemical properties. It means uh, we focus it um, the, in importantly in the antioxidant capacity and total phenolic content of the microalgae residual biomass after the oil extraction. The results are very interesting again because the the values obtained of antioxidant capacity are nearly or even higher than, than some source, source of uh, traditional source of antioxidant compounds. Also, they, uh, we try to analyze the potential performance in the food productions, and we have also uh, important um, results here. Uh, connecting the biodiesel production with the production of valuable compounds in form of food additives. Uh, the, 
lastest work that we are uh, making now is the is a project in the master in applied science uh, the developed by andrea garate uh, we are working with dunaliera tertiolecta um, and analyzing the biomass uh, potential for obtaining of byproduct bioproduct uh, here we have the target initial target product the biodiesel we make the growth kinetics, we harvest the biomass with sedimentation, flocculation, and uh, after the lipid extractions, the potential from biodiesel production was analyzed. Uh, after that, the, the fatty residual biomass uh, was characterized and was tried uh, in biomethane potential test using different inoculum to analyze the, the biogas production from this defined residual biomass. Uh, one time we, we found the best affinity of the, in, of the inoculum, we make uh, um, co-digestion with the glycerol again for in, in order to, to make an integral use of the residual of the, of the biodiesel. Um, and make a co-digestion to analyze the potential bio biogas improvement of the of the of this residual biomass. Also, and we analyze the antioxidant potential of this defined residual biomass. This, with the intention of have or or show two possible pathways: uh, the biodiesel production plus the biogas or the biodiesel production plus antioxidant potential. Um, this could allow uh, to make decisions for which process could be better. Um, this was uh, many of the works that we are making in this topic of biorefinery of microalgae. Um, as concluding remarks, we can say that um, the energy situation has been turned the attention in the production of biofuels. It means uh, renewable energy with uh, lowest impact to the environment. The biorefinery concept has been identified as a promising way for obtaining biofuels. Yes, and the microalgae, because the characteristic and high wide variability of potential uses represents an important tool to develop this biorefinery process. But for reach this higher production or this commercial production of, of biorefinery of microalgae, uh, there are some topics that is, has to be uh, more investigated. It's important um, the characterization of the strains. Uh, as, as I say, it's important to find uh, microalgae species with a high potential gro of growth in the environmental conditions of the of the regions. It means uh, I will search microalgae species that grow uh, especially well or shows a good performance in my region. So it maybe is not they will not be the same species that Italy or Brazil, but it's important to make this research for for have this pool of strains to be used. Also, the development of the technology for transform the biomass to biorefinery or different products is important to to make this process more economically feasible. It means. We have to find technology to develop technologies that requires less energy. This will represent a better price of the final product for the competition with the typical oils. Also, uh, we have to the, develop more research about these non-conventional uses of microalgae. Uh, microalgae. This um, non-conventional uses has to be integrated with the technologies that works well now. This for have more options to develop value added of the biomass. 
Also, <clears throat> it's fundamental the use of saline water or waste water for microagriculture. The fresh water uh, species are not recommended because uh, if we think in, in um, massive production, we need high quantity of waters. And if we use species, fresh water species, we are attempting with the availability of water for human consumption. Uh, so this is why I, uh, it's important the use of residual water may, is maybe the, the best option because when we uh, make the growth of the microalgae, also we treat the water. See, this is important to focus in this uh, kind of cultures. Uh, uh, one part that I didn't uh, speak a lot, but it's very important in this kind of technology, is the necessary the, the development of life cycle analysis studies. Uh, this life cycle analysis could uh, validate the viability for environmental aspect and economic aspect. So we can make, um, we are working in developing process for obtaining value uh, products of microalgae. But after the development of this technology, it's necessary to analyze the viability of, of the process. Uh, and this part is, is very important in the microalgae technology. Um, for finish, uh, we, have, we have here with the, in the microalgae a big opportunity, uh, a big opportunity to generate products that will help to the to the diminish the the climate change to have an op different options for economic uh, growth because these uh, these microorganisms ch shows a high potential for production of value products. Uh, I think it's, it's all for my for my participation. Uh, I would I would like to thanks to the organizations to the to the Dr. Sergio Rossi who invited to 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 this uh, interesting interesting uh, event. Fantastic! Really, very good. Also, a very 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 nice uh, just travel all over the, these uh, possibilities of uh, microalgae. David is, uh, is, a, is a really amazing thing. Uh, I was aware about the, uh, some of the possibilities of this, uh, this microorganism, but there are some of them that, at least for me, are completely new. And that, of course, very, very interesting. So now what we will do is uh, having a, a chat, a, a small chat during uh, some minutes uh, with the questions of the people that has been here with us all this time, uh, just uh, looking at the presentations and uh, just uh, uh, also uh, learning many things from you. And the first question that is uh, for uh, Professor uh, Alberto, which is from Jadson that say, integrating multitrophic aquaculture and recycled aquaculture systems are two systems that look for a sustainable development. Do you know any example of company that combines both systems? Uh, did he mention any system? I mean, uh, did he, he mention the name, Sergio? Yes, uh, INTA, Integrated Multitrophic Aquaculture, and the RAS, which is their yeah, recycling aquaculture systems. Well, a, a lot has been said about uh, multitrophic aquaculture. But in practice, we don't see it happening, and there are reasons for that. Uh, one of them is because you're farming different species, so um, it, it's, it makes it quite complex, you know. And, and multitrophic aquaculture is basically you're going to occupy different areas of that environment that you're using to farm an animal or a plant. So the concept is really interesting, but bringing that concept to reality is, is a bit complex. I mean, the industry is not really interested because you're, as I said, you're, you're dealing with different animals or different plants and commercializing these products, different products, it's, it's a bit complex. Uh, so I have not seen it, 
um, um, uh, commercial multi-trophic systems or a combination of multi-trophic systems and RAS. I have not seen it yet. Okay, uh, that's a very interesting, uh, really a very interesting topic. Uh, I have a, a question for Professor Santos from Dulce that says, uh, do microalgae biorefineries already exist commercially around the world? Uh, yes, uh, there are some uh, companies that, uh, especially in the USA and in Europe, uh, in Belgium especially, uh, when they uh, produce microalgae, but the principal or the target products are not biofuels. They are used for uh, antioxidants like proteins and and use it for supplements uh, for feed al uh, alimentary in the in the agriculture and the aquaculture. There exist uh, some enterprises in Mexico we have a, a, an enterprise that use the microalgae uh, and they produce uh, alimentary supplementers supplements uh, with high protein contents these are the principal uses now uh, the biofuels is like a secondary target now because the cost of the of the biofuels of microalgae not compete with the cost of the, of the typical non-renewable sources. Well, in fact, it is, it is one of the topics that is, uh, it has been working. I mean, during the last uh, years, there has been a decrease in interest in the microalgae as biofuel, but it's because oil is still cheap. The fossil fuels are still cheap, but in any case, uh, and this related with this uh, question, my question will be, would you think that really this kind of microalgae could represent locally a strategic uh, energetic, uh, energetic advance or, or not? Uh, I think uh, it has the potential for, for, for represent uh, an opportunity for local growth of these biorefineries, but uh, it's necessary uh, more participations of the of the science, of the industries, and for the government. Because nowadays, uh, the technology of uh, is, is growing, is, 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 is growing in an in, uh, interesting way, but mm, the process are not ready yet. It's necessary to do more uh, research to, <clears throat> to assure this, uh, this participation in local. But I think for the properties of the microalgae, I think is, is the, a good opportunity. We have uh, reports in, in Mexico that, that in regions when they the microalgae grow naturally, they, they grow in the sea. Yeah. It's important to take this species, analyze the potential for bioproducts. Uh, yeah, it, it is true. I have a question for uh, for you, uh, Stefano, and it's from Andre, who say, Professor Stefano, thanks for your nice talk. Do you think it is possible to change the general public view about jellyfish? Instead of being seen as a problematic uh, issue, they can be seen as a provider for mankind? That's a very <clears throat> a difficult question because it depends. It depends on uh, if you live in Australia and you deal with... Uh, highly venomous uh, box jellyfish, <laughs> yeah. that's difficult to change uh, the public perception. But if you deal uh, with uh, non-venomous, uh, non-stinging jellyfish, uh, like many of the species that we have in, uh, in the Mediterranean, actually we see there are, there are many, uh, chi many, many children that can uh, play with the jellyfish uh, on the beach, uh, uh, in the water, they love to see them swimming in the water. And indeed, even in the uh, Philippines, in Palau, there is, the, uh, there is a lake uh, with the golden jellyfish uh, yeah. where there are more than 20,000 uh, uh, dives uh, per year of people that go there for swimming with, with the jellyfish. And so and actually, the perspective is to see them uh, as a resource uh, is a for, for leisure, not only for food 
for food, but uh, they also can provide uh, uh, drugs uh, that can be beneficial for our health. Oh, yeah. I hope so. Yeah, I think so. I, uh, Rabindra is uh, asking a question for, for you, Alberto. Uh, he's uh, asking if uh, you know how to control the uh, common uh, the disease, the white spot disease in, uh, in SRIMS. <laughs> I, w uh, I wish I knew, you know, the white spot is a very aggressive virus that uh, once shrimp is infected, uh, shrimp will die within three days. And it has caused a lot of uh, loss in uh, shrimp farming, uh, not only in Asia, but also uh, here in the South, uh, South America and Central America. Well, the best way to control white spot is uh, implement biosecurity measures, which is a bit difficult to do it in large operations in ponds where you have to exchange water. You, um, biosecurity under these conditions are not effective. However, if you have uh, small compact farms and you do water reuse, you treat the water and reuse it, and you use a clean source of host larvae of shrimp, then you're safe. You know, the main uh, form of transmission of white spots is from the parents to uh, the post larvae. So infective animals that you bring to the farm. So if you can make sure that you're using clean animals without white spots, which we call SPF, a specific pathogen free, and that your environment is also clean and free of white spot, then uh, you won't have it. Uh, however, once you have it, there's not a lot you can do. Uh, you have basically use good management practices, low stocking density, keep the environment uh, well balanced, uh, and then maybe you can survive uh, a, an outbreak of white spots. But, you know, white spot is, is usually a, a major problem in the beginning uh, once it arrives. but over the years, uh, the virus becomes present. Animals are infective, effective, uh, affected by the virus, but they may not die. For some reason, it appears as if the animal develops some tolerance to the virus, which is very interesting. And that's what's happening right now in Brazil. Okay. Yes, and this, uh, this kind of control has to have a cost, I, mean, I guess. I mean, it's costly to, to have this clear waters and also these clear rings that has to be right right i mean it, the thing is what's this interesting is that uh here in the americas shrimp is farmed under semi-intensive conditions so these are large operations large ponds and low stocking density in these conditions uh biosecurity is is not effective you have birds flying over the farm you have people coming in you're doing water exchange on the other side, if you go to Asia, if you go to Thailand, Indonesia, farms are very small, but they're very intensive. So in that case, they're able to use uh, clean post larvae and they are able to be uh, economically feasible because they're doing high density farming as opposed to here in the Americas where ponds are open uh, and you have low productivity, you, you achieve low yields. Uh, uh, in, a, in a farm in Ecuador, in Brazil, your, your yield per crop is about 1,000 kilograms of shrimp per hectare per crop. Whereas in Asia, you're talking about 12, 20,000 uh, uh, kilos of shrimp per hectare. So it's much more intensive, but on yeah. the other side, you're able to implement some of these biosecurity practices in a very effective way because farms are very small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, having this kind of uh, of thing is is really important for that. I uh, Jackson asked a question that maybe for Alberto or for David, I guess. Which is, is, do you know if there is companies that use micro or micro micro algae farming combined with uh, uh, aquaculture to make other products? So. If you have uh, the organism, whatever it is, is it a fish, for example, and then you cultivate a microalgae or a macroalgae and use this microalgae to make other byproducts, like for example, biofuel. Do you know if there is people that is making this combination? I remember that uh, um, 
in the past, uh, uh, the professor um, Lobo Farias, that was on the Universidad Federal of Ciarad and uh, uh, unfortunately passed away, he was trying to make this kind of, of, of uh, combinations. Uh, there is something about that? Uh, I, I didn't uh, know for a industry that work in this way. There are studies. Uh, I have the, the opportunity during my PhD to, to be there with the Dr. Lobo Farias. Uh, I remember uh, with a, very well. Uh, he, he was working with that, with use uh, continuous continuous uh, process when the, they use a the microalgae to as living uh, living food, we can say, uh, in the chain of food, alimentary chain of the of the of the aquaculture fish, but uh, I didn't see in this, uh, at least at, as I know, in the in the industry, uh, I didn't see yet, because this is an, an important. Uh, opportunity. Uh, I have uh, the opportunity also to be in Cadiz uh, and they also use the microalgae as living food. So this kind of uh, uh, studies have a big opportunity to, to better, but I didn't see in the industry yet. Applied yet. Okay. So, uh, Stefano, uh, the question is for me, uh, uh, you talk about the Medusa and uh, when you talk about the Medusa, you talk that some Medusa uh, may be easily eaten, like for example, uh, Rhizostoma, but other were not in the list. Why there are Medusa that can be uh, food, that can be processed as food and others that cannot be processed as food? Because uh, the text, so you mean like, uh, the moon jellyfish is probably the better no the best known jellyfish but it's not considered as uh, appropriate as a as a food item because uh, the water content uh, is higher the texture of the jellyfish because of the mesoglia where the uh, the collagen is concentrated is too thin so there is no consistency in the in the in the, in the organism and there is no way to use it uh, appropriately so, so even to the, the size of, of the animals is, is, is small. It's not a matter of it's a matter of, of water of proportion of water, in fact. And sides, and okay. sides. Okay, 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 size okay. It can be reached. Some jellyfish can be as large as um, as they can weigh like a motorcycle, uh, yeah. or it can be large like your refrigerator in the kitchen. Uh, others can be smaller than two millimeters. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, Alberto Jackson uh, also has an, a, a specific question that I think uh, is interesting. It's, he says in northeastern Brazil, there is some, there are some places with uh, underground brackish waters. Do you think it is possible to implement some kind of aquaculture, integrated multitrophic aquaculture or aquaculture using this kind of waters? Of course, of course, you can do it. Um... The thing is, uh, you you need to find a species that it's tolerant to brackish water, right? Um, that's that's a problem we have in Brazil. The only farm species that we have, commercially farmed species that will tolerate brackish water, is the white leg shrimp. Uh, it's amazing that we don't have any other animal that it's able to be commercially cultured in Brazil. No fish. Uh, no other species that will tolerate brackish water. Uh, you may have tilapia. Tilapia can go up to 25 parts per thousand, but uh, you know that could be an option. Um, but if you don't have a fish, a marine fish, or a, a fish from uh, brackish water. So the, I think the issue you will find is basically if, if he's looking at doing shrimp and fish, is finding an appropriate species to do this multi-tropic system. And here in the lab, we, we do uh, salicornia, you know, we have these, uh, high, uh, these plants uh, in our uh, uh, treatment, uh, treatment system. Before we discharge the water, it goes through a series of, um, of, of plants before it's, it goes back to the, uh, to the, to the environment. So and it, these plants can withstand high salinity conditions. 
So that could be an alternative for him as well. You know, uh, the the other the, the trouble he may have is to find the right market for these plants. You know, because it's not commonly consumed in Brazil. Okay, I have another question uh, from Marta, David. Uh, which are the pros and, and cons of the three different trophic cultivations that you say? And is the dixotrophic the most advantage, uh, advantage sorry, in terms of bioenergy production? Uh, okay, uh, the difference between these uh, trophic conditions of culture are that the autotrophic conditions use the CO2 uh, directly from the air, we can say, uh, for the environment to develop the photosynthesis. The heterotrophic use uh, another source of carbon for for developing the photosynthesis. And the mixotrophic is a combination when we take CO2 from the environment, also take another source of carbon from the medium. Uh, <clears throat> and there are many studies from that shows the mixotrophic uh, has most advantage in terms of bioenergy productions, but it will also always depend on the species of microalgae because uh, some species of microalgae work better in mixotrophic conditions, but other species work, work better in autotrophic and other in heterotrophic. But <clears throat> uh, it's important to, to, to analyze all the species or the interesting species for mixotrophic conditions. The advantage of these mixotrophic conditions is that we have uh, two benefits. We use the CO2 from the, the environment to, and we also can uh, treat the, the residual waters in the same time. So theoretically, this is the, the best the best process for biofuels production from microalgae, but not all the strains and the species of microalgae react in the same way. Okay. I have the last three questions and then we can close. One is for Stefano. This, uh, Stefano, you were talking about this turritopsis and this about this uh, immortal medusa and this immortal aerosol, which has been, uh, I mean, it's, it's uh, it, people knows everywhere, I, I, indeed. And people, not only biologists, but many people say, the immortal medusa, and they think about uh, this kind of, uh, of organism. I don't know exactly how they are just uh, looking at, uh, at the possibilities. And the question is, you are making a particular project in which you are studying the possibilities. What do you think will be or could be the... You do you talk about, but very general, if you can specify a little bit more, if you have some finding uh, in which you are trying to apply this kind of, uh, of uh, processes uh, to, for example, myomedicine. For example, to? Biomedicine. What? Biomedicine. Bio, biomedicine, but certainly not uh, regarding aging, but the application can be in the understanding mechanism controlling the stability of cell differentiation. That means, for instance, uh, cancer is something that happens when a cells start to uh, do not recognize anymore the neighboring cells and so start uh, replicating and um, invading other organs and this is because uh, the, the stability of cell differentiation is uh, is lost is forgotten by that cell so understanding the uh, mechanism controlling the stability of cell differentiation may help to understand uh, pathologies like uh, tumorigenesis or for instance parkinson's is a neurodegenerative disease that uh, there are some nerve cells that uh, uh, normally produce uh, dopamine and uh, sometimes there is a switch, a molecular switch that interrupt the production of dopamine. We don't know why. And so understanding how to reactivate this molecular switch would be very interesting. No way to understand uh, or avoid aging. Aging is something that is linked strictly to the birth. <laughs> of yeah, any yeah, 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 yeah. I, I sent a message. I, I am not able to to write in the in the chat, but I, I would like to to ask a question to Alberto. Can I do that now? 
Yes, of course. <laughs> These uh, are round table. Uh, yes, okay. Um, Alberto, you showed a very interesting data because uh, you showed that uh, the majority of the fish production of protein in aquaculture is uh, made by 20, 27 species, a uh, very limited number of, uh, of uh, species. But also you showed uh, two closely related species, uh, a big uh, Asian sea bass and a small uh, species, which anyway, it's, as I understood well, is phylogenetically not far distant, so it's quite uh, close phylogenetically. Do you think that uh, uh, the advances in genetics, uh, particularly now, this year, there was a Nobel Prize uh, uh, related to this uh, um, CRISPR-Cas9, uh, which is a, a powerful tool that made possible to make uh, micro surgery on the genome. So you can insert precisely some genes and something something that has been done also on, on salmons uh, in some in some cases with the repeated uh, um, uh, experiment of crossing a different uh, generation but in this case it's much much faster to create uh, uh, not general necessarily uh, at least uh, to induce uh, uh, a better growth or a more rapid growth even in species which normally have a, a much slower growth. Do you think that they, this might, might be something for the future of uh, aquaculture? Well, as a matter of fact, this has been done already. I mean, this year we have harvested uh, the first salmon that has been genetically engineered for fast growth. It's a, if I'm not mistaken, it's being grown in Canada or in the US and it basically achieves uh, the final, the market weight in a half uh, the time of the regular uh, farm salmon. Uh, obviously, uh, genetic genetic engineering, the way it has been done, has a lot of uh, concerns. You know, uh, not everyone wants to eat a fish that has been, uh, you know, it ha has had its DNA modified. So it's it's I think it's more of a question whether the market will accept that kind of how it it's going to to be. Uh, I mean, just look at the soybean that we have that is produced in Brazil. Brazil is a large uh, one, maybe I think the largest producer of soybean and the largest exporter of soybean. Uh, but you know, all the salmon uh, farmed in Norway, for example, they buy a lot of soybean from Brazil. And but they want GMO free soybean. They don't want to buy the 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 the, the GMO uh, uh, soybean that we have. They want everything to be GMO free because European consumers will not eat fish that has been fed with soybean uh, that has been modified. So it's it's not. I don't think it's a question of of uh, of technology. I think these tools are available today. It's more of how the consumer will uh, take these products. So, uh, I mean, we have so many species that have not been studied, specifically in Brazil. I mean, there's dozens of species that we don't know their potential for aquaculture. So maybe instead of doing all these genetic uh, manipulations, maybe it it's, might be easier to find the right species for farming, you know? Okay. Thank you. I, I have a question. I have the last question for you, Alberto, that which is uh, is more a curiosity than a question, uh, because in one point of your presentation, you talk about the closing the cycle of the lobster in Tasmania. In 1991, when I made biobiology, we made a seminar with um, a guy who was making aquaculture. And he told us one thing that I convinced that is truth. He said that uh, the person who will close the cycle in aquaculture of the tuna, not necessarily the red tuna, the tuna, uh, he, will be, he will get rich. That was 1991, and I think that tuna, uh, tuna is, is not, uh, is only uh, fed, but it's not farmed. You know, there is, no, nobody could, no, nobody closed the cycle. But the cycle has been closed already. In the, uh, in uh, uh, farming, is this is this is a question because I'm not updated. From, no, from 1991. Tuna, tuna uh, cycle has been closed. Yeah, then it's it's another thing, you know. I mean, um, it's 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 also a question. I mean, 
since you still have fish available in the water, you can do just capture them, do sea ranking. I think it's in that case, it's more uh, uh, the, the, the question of economics than, than the technology uh, that is available. But the cycle has been closed, yes. And uh, I know there are companies that are, are trying to implement some of these technologies. This is a question of economics. You know, another thing about tuna farming is that, uh, I mean, the, the, the largest consumers of tuna are in Japan. And these consumers, uh, these buyers, will not accept tuna that has been fed with beans. They want tuna that has been fed with fish. So it's, you know, it's really in the hands of the consumers, you know. Uh, sometimes the technology works, but the economics is not there. But the cycle of, uh, I'm not sure if it's the blue, blue bean tuna or another species, it has been closed, yes. And okay. I don't think anybody is rich yet. <laughs> no, 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 no. It, it was a curiosity because in st indeed, well, he was talking about in that case of red tuna with the Mediterranean, Atlantic Mediterranean tuna. And, uh, and of course, uh, it's uh, the most appreciated tuna. I mean, the red tuna is the, 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 the more uh, expensive tuna that you may find in the, in the market. They have been paying up to 600,000 uh, euros for only one tuna. Uh, so it's really uh, incredible, but it's okay. So last thing, and I will, uh, and I, we will stop, is just uh, by order, first Alberto, then Stefano, and then uh, David, just uh, give me a snapshot of what you think about the opportunity that we have uh, this decade of the oceans about the blue growth. Uh, uh, should I begin, uh, Sergio? Yes, yes. Well, I think aquaculture, I mean, the, 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 the idea that I had for this talk, and I also did the same talk for Lovamont, is that I, I, want, I, I want everyone to look at aquaculture with a different perspective, and especially the, the outside public who's not directly involved with aquaculture. I mean, there's so many, um, um, you know, different uh, wrong views of aquaculture, you know, mangrove destruction, I mean, uh, there has been mangrove destructions back in the 80s, back in the 90s. I have not seen any mangrove destruction, maybe for the past 15 years, caused by shrimp farming or any other activity. And then you have the issue related to the uh, discharge of effluents. As I said, aquaculture today is trying to protect itself from all the pollution, and not otherwise. So I, I think it's, it's time to see start to look at aquaculture in a different way with a different view uh, that aquaculture is here actually to make a change in our lives in regards to the aquatic protein supply uh, and that fisheries I mean I was I'm a fisheries engineer I was trained to fish uh, but very early on I realized that the future of fisheries is, uh, is aquaculture and, and I think that's that's the way we need to see it, and we need to try to solve the, the issues that exist today. And you have we have raised some of them, uh, and I think we have the, the the tools and technology to do so. Thank you, Stefano. Um, I think Marimba University is larger on Explore already said something and during my presentation i think that uh, well if just looking at the numbers of uh, drugs patented from marine organisms they are so fewer in compared to the drugs derived from uh, terrestrial organisms and plants so we we but the biodiversity of uh, in the ocean is so uh, much uh, wider than uh, it's uh, certainly worth to invest uh, more in, uh, in, the, in the search for new organisms to be uh, and to be to, to support uh, blue, blue growth in terms of the production of food and production of new molecules, new materials. Absolutely, we should invest more in basic science, and this will return back uh, uh, tenfold higher in terms of uh, new opportunities for applied science. Thank you. And uh, what about you, David? Well, I think uh, that this uh, blue growth it is related with the use of the sea resources. Uh, and I think here we have a big opportunity because um, 
for example, uh, in Mexico, the aquaculture is uh, a practice um, with a high use, with a high development. Um, I like very much the the presentation of Stefano when the when they talk the possibility of this organism to, to develop uh, bioproducts, commercial products. So this uh, sea, the sea has uh, a big number of organisms that we can use for generate value of, of products of high value. Uh, but uh, it's important to analyze well the, the the environmental impact of the use of these products. Uh, it's always uh, has to be done the research. Uh, it's important to, to develop new process, to analyze new materials, but also uh, analyze the, the potential uh, or make a restriction with the use of these materials because Sometimes the human uh, are, is the way of, of the human. Uh, we we find some some someone uh, something useful, and we use very yeah. much uh, until reach uh, generate another problem. So I think this part has to be is a big opportunity, but has to be well um, analyzed the use of this blue, blue growth. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, I'm, it was an immense pleasure to have it, you three here. Uh, thanks for your time, because I know that uh, you, you, you just invest a lot of time uh, being here. Uh, it has been very successful. The, the, the quality of the talks in general and your talks too were really uh, abst uh, outstanding. I mean, I have many uh, many comments in, in, in my WhatsApp, so it's uh, really uh, incredible. Also, the comments of the people, of course, of, of YouTube. Um, really, thank you very much indeed. And now we are just going to, to close, so thank you to you. Thank you to you, Sergio. You organized this wonderful event, and thanks to all the other speakers that also preceded us in the in the former days. It was a really uh, a very very nice, and uh, I hope this will be the the first of a long series of uh, bilateral events. Good, good, well done. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much, and congratulations for the event. I hope that this will be more uh, interactions between uh, between our group works. Uh, nice to, to meet you, Stefano and Alberto. I, I, I like very much the, the presentations. And, and I will I, I like the, the the all the event. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> thank you, David. You can be sure that we will interact. All right. Thank you very much, Sergio. And uh, nice meeting you, uh, David and Stefano. We hope that next year we'll do this in, 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 in person. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Look forward. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. okay. Have a nice day. Have a nice night. Nice <laughs> Goodbye. Bye.